Hey there, Smite fans, Agro here. Look, every single year, the SPL just keeps getting better. Season seven was incredible. And in season eight, I'm sure our players are gonna take their game to the next level. But in order to do that, they're gonna need the best gear they can get their hands on. And that's why I'm so excited to announce the title sponsor for season eight of the SPL is Alienware. Yeah, that Alienware. Our players are getting the best of the best in computer gaming. These Alienware Aurora Ryzen Edition PC setups are insane. Not only will these be the PCs that the players will compete on once we are in studio, but Alienware is also providing one for each player at their home setup to make sure their practice is as good as possible. Now let's get down to brass tacks. The specs on these Alienware Aurora Ryzen Edition desktops are amazing. An AMD Ryzen 9 16 core processor, that's a lot of cores. That's plenty of processing <laughs> power. That's a lot of cores. <laughs> plenty of cores. If you want to stream, this, this is the way to go. I know a lot about my cores, so. I mean, Pilates, right? 64 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM. What? Yeah. Is that true? That is true. I mean, this thing has 64 gigs of DDR4 RAM. Which you can do literally anything, anything with. Literally anything. I've never had more than 16 gigs. That's quadruple I might not have them. And one of the hottest commodities in the PC world, an NVIDIA GeForce 3090 graphics card. Insane, how, how much better this is than what I have. The best graphics you really need, Ultra, of course. Content's gonna look good. What's the point of all the power if you can't see it? Players will also be using the Alienware 25 inch 240 hertz monitors. Man, when I load into scrims with this bad boy, I'm gonna feed so hard. <laughs> and it's gonna be in perfect picture quality. We are so excited to be partnering with Alienware for season eight of the Smite Pro League. And the best part is, this VIP treatment, not just for the pros, you too can get the best possible Smite experience. Just go to smitegame.com slash Alienware and use code SMITEAW to get special discounts on some of Alienware's best products. Thanks again to Alienware. Make sure you're following them on Twitter, on Instagram, that's at Alienware on both platforms and you can join their community at alienwarearena.com. And you're telling me an alien wore this? <laughs>
You're more than right, Mifflin. And in fact, for today, we're actually going to be starting off hot with that Olympus Bolts versus Atlantis Leviathans. Like I just touched on, the Olympus Bolts and Leviathans actually going to be an in-studio set here today. So we're going to get an opportunity to see these players face off on land. Of course, the Olympus Bolts, they've already been here. Zatman as well. Now he's with that Atlantis Leviathans roster. But after that, we'll have the Jade Dragons up against the Camelot Kings, as you can see for tomorrow. A couple of cool sets coming in hot as well. But more importantly, Mifflin, these sets today are going to be huge establishment marks, I think, for the Olympus Bolts potentially and for the rest of the members on these other teams. As you can see, Olympus Bolts right now, top of the charts here, 5-0 and oh win loss. Camelot Kings hot on their tails, but the J Dragons, Atlantis Leviathans, these are never teams to undermine. And it's worth noting, the Olympus Bolts have a little bit more LAN experience so far this year. Uh, one of the two teams to have played, but luckily, I think the Leviathans shore that up ever so slightly with the addition of Zatman. I mean, you got to play one LAN already. That's true. Zatman did, in fact, have a chance to play with the Scarabs, although that was under the circumstances originally of having their coach sub in for that solo lane position here today. Zatman, new synergy, new team, but in order to get through today, he's going to have to go up against the Olympus Bolts and Mifflin. When it comes to the Bolts, it just feels like they just keep doing everything right. And where do you think a lot of this stems from? <sighs> well, if you're asking me personally, it's almost always going to be the jungle, right? I almost always want to talk about the jungler, but I was given explicit instruction to talk about mid laners this time around, so I guess we can highlight how good Ven's been outside of that role, or inside of that role, rather. He has got a versatile god pool. He's a, a handsome gamer. See him smiling over there, and, well, I, it's hard to shut him down. Get, moving away from the memes, he has really come into his own as a player this year in his aggressive styling. I mean, watch these Tiamat clips. Is he ever in that bipedal stance? Is he ever just shooting his damage downrange? No, this guy is being a frontliner through the mid-roll. And it's interesting that you say all these things about the mid laners having an opportunity to play a little bit more aggressively, but we'll actually get an opportunity to hear from Venenu directly as we've got Dolson standing by with Venenu to cover some of these pregame interview actions that are going to be taking place for this Atlantis Leviathans and Olympus Bolt set. So, Dolson, without further ado. Take it on over. Here we go. It's Venenu and, and Dolson this time, not Barracuda. So, no hand holding. Okay, sorry. Eye contact's fine. Okay. But we're keeping things strictly professional here yes, this sir. time. Uh, Venenu, back in studio. Yeah. Are you, ma are you uh, matching me or am I matching you? Oh, you're, that's just well, the professional I'm not, I'm pose. I get bigger to match you. No, not, none of that. We've already, I haven't asked one question. We're off the rails already. I don't know what's going on here. Miff, get out of here. Yeah, tiptoes, there you go. All right, so I am going to ask at least a couple serious questions. Uh, you joked about it during the, the highlight segment there. Uh, Vulcan. It's yeah. a very specific, very weird question, but uh, is that something we start to see on a more regular basis here? Uh, I mean, you might see him more, but I mean, he's just a more fun character to play yeah. and uh, definitely enjoyed him more Good. than playing some of the other stuff. So. Thumbs up. Well, look, <laughs> you're going against the Leviathans today, who is a team in recent matchups you've had success against. The, mm -hmm. the Phase 1 playoffs you won, you, you've, you've beaten them. I think in your last two sets against them. Mm -hmm. Now a bit of a different change, though, obviously, in studio, but also with Zapman. Yep. Does that change your prep against this team at all? Uh, it changes it a little bit. Sure. Uh, I think a fun fact, I don't think we've ever beat them on normal, Ooh. like during the normal season. So That's this is actually going to be a good game. Uh, I'm excited to play in studio against them. Um, but yeah, it changes the prep a little bit. I think Zap plays a little bit of a different style than Yarkor. Right. Um, but I mean, they've been queuing together and everything like that. So they might have adapted to his style or Zap might have adapted to their style. So excited Wh to see. What about over in the solo lane? Because Yarkor is back <laughs> there. You, you still have Haddock's in a pretty good matchup. Yeah. Similar, uh, similar mindset, maybe a different yeah. play style, but you're still uh, prepped for it? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I mean, Haddix is a really good player, and yeah, I think he'll do fine. And uh, Papa <laughs> Yaga maybe is going to be important here today. Shinto's been playing that one a lot. Yeah. We'll see. We'll but Anu, thanks for your time. Best <laughs> of luck. I'll let you go get ready. All right, sounds good. Back to the desk. You, Dulcin, as well as Venenu for taking the time to join us for that little pregame interview segment. But Mifflin, a couple of definite changes here for the Atlantis Leviathans today. As Venenu already mentioned, with Zatman now with that hunter role and Jarkor moving on over to the solo lane. Uh, what do you expect this to influence from the Bolts playstyle? I'm not sure that it's going to affect the Bolts too much, so the Bolts are a team that have really been just playing their own style. I mean, Zatman, about six weeks ago when he was on the Scarabs, gave an interview and said, look, the Bolts have a, a pretty good strategy. They're going to invade my first purple buff. If they get that, 
they win the game, and if they don't, they don't. And that hasn't really been the case recently, but we still do see the Bolts consistently going for these invades. They've varied it up a little bit, sometimes the blue buff, sometimes the red nowadays, but... I, I don't know. It's more so in competitive smite in any esport about playing your own game instead of trying to limit what your opposition's doing. And I think when it comes to playing your own game, Shinto is a primary example of a player that I think really just tries to min-max every single segment of the map throughout a given game. And Mifflin, at least from your perspective, what do you think that Shinto does best up against other players? Uh, he farms. He, he farms really, really well. His team makes sure he's doing it. I mean, it, it, at any any point, if you look at the Leviathans, they could be 3,000 gold down as a team. Well, Shinto's going to be up 500 gold on his own, trying to get that lead. They consistently try and play through this guy because they know how reliable he is as that backline damage. I mean, how often is he just able to do whatever he wants, free cast inside of these fights because the Leviathans are so good at drafting these compositions just to protect them. I mean, take a peek at it. Baba Yaga surrounded by a ton of frontliners inside of just this clip. I mean, Odin. Fenrir, Cerberus. Yeah, I think they're trying to protect Shinto, and well, it's a good strategy. Not many teams have been able to beat it. Especially when you factor in that a lot of the gods that Shinto seems to be kind of circulating around as of late are just these heavy burst mages with Baba Yaga as well, a little bit of utility inside of her kit, and a lot of potential, I think, when it comes to team fight and just contributing to the chaos, wow, look at those notes. which can just kind of play hand in hand alongside the Leviathan's aggressive front line. And wow. I'm glad that you brought up the notes, Mifflin, That's because it up. looks like a stacked notebook. Look at look at the back. It's like his own spreadsheet. That's like Man's a tome. Man's Excel on paper. That is, that, it's actually nuts. That notebook is beat up, filled out. It, it's been worked through. This coach clearly been worked through the bone here. I, and I love to see that type of stuff because very often coaches get memed in the Smite community. Well, it's very clear that my man Oxy is putting in the work. Yeah, Oxyle Don. He's been a fantastic member, I think, for the Leviathans. As we noted um, last time, Leviathans had to have him sub in, in God, fact, what a legend. as the solo lane, and given some unfortunate circumstances surrounding Leviathan's solo lane originally. But again, those are woes of the past. This is a new and revitalized Atlantis Leviathans roster for what it's worth. And I think that Zapman's contribution to this team could honestly be a little bit of a menace here for the Bolts. Yeah, Zapman, one of the best land players that we've ever had, always consistently coming into playoffs or world championships from about middle of the pack and then somehow elevates his team up into that world champion contender. The two-time here now on the side of the Leviathans. I think that he's going to bring a lot of veteranship. He's going to bring a, a lot of good energy. He's going to keep these boys focused and make sure on game day at lands they're performing at their best. And performance all comes down to a lot inside of the draft itself, Mifflin. Bolts are actually going to have their first pick option for game number one here today, of the Bolts versus the Atlantis Leviathans. But Mifflin, do you expect there to maintain a heavy frontline focus? Because oftentimes when teams are going up against this Leviathans roster, there tends to be a pretty big emphasis around taking away ideal picks from Ronnie Gu. Yeah, and when you think of ideal picks for Ronnie Gu, as uh, you so eloquently put, there's Terra, you can talk about the Horus, Yamoja, those are his top three picks. About 30% of the time, he's running one of those three, and well, those are some very highly contested picks, and certainly something that the 408 is capable of playing as well. So far, though, inside the bands, it seems like they've got a little bit more of their eyes towards Shinto. Yeah, Shinto is definitely going to have some issues here, having the Raijin and the Baba Yaga taken away. Granted, don't necessarily need to prioritize your mid lane pick right up front, especially when the Leviathans are definitely recognizing that the Bolts seem to be taking note of, of Shinto, so they'll respond with equal presence. Tiamat, Soul, no longer in play. Fender has been a fairly heavily contested pick here, though, for the Bolts, but it's going to be the Emoja instead can't provide any sort of opportunity for Leviathans to get that for the support. No, just so much sustain and lane pressure, and a lot, very often games are won through pressure out of that long lane. You're able to control the Gold Fury, control invades, and if you have Yamoja, well, you've already got a good deal of pressure out of that lane, but what is left available with so many mid bands already rolling through? Gotta think, maybe we get a chance to see something like a Yanis locked in. Ven used to be one of the premier Yanis players. Very recently, we saw Shinto have his first performance on this god, but what am I talking about, man? Heimdall and Fenrir still out there? Gotta go there. 
Is that man known for his aggressive play style, and he is certainly living up to that presence with that Heimdall selection, Myth. Although, do you imagine that Heimdall could potentially struggle up against the likes of Yamoja and Osiris? Because it seems as though the Bolts already have a ton of dive and separation with those two god picks alone. I think Heimdall's got decent survivability into Osiris alone. You're able to just use that Gallarhorn knockup and ride the Bifrost to wherever you need to be. I mean, he is one of the safest, if not the safest hunter in the game. So, I'm sure that Zatman very happy with that selection for himself. Almost said hardcore there, but it is that man inside the ADC roll. Your hardcore moves over to the solo lane, and now Artemis locked in. That's a pick that I think is incredibly strong into Heimdall. You're going to have to stand still inside of that Bifrost, drop that Transgressor's Fate. You're stuck. You're, you're crippled. You're not teleporting. And now Artemis is dealing additional damage because you're CC'd. Artemis can also be a little bit tricky for the likes of a Fenrir to try and punish throughout that laning phase segment. Fenrir, I think, oftentimes heavily regarded for that brutalized damage. But with the Artemis on that Transgressor's Fate, like you just mentioned, Mifflin, there is a definite turn and burn opportunity presented here for the Bolts, but the problem is Artemis can only really peel one thing at a time, and between a Heimdall, Fenrir, and Fafnir, do you expect the Leviathans are just going to try and channel a lot of their aggression through that dual lane? I think so. They, they can try and utilize that lack of mobility from Artemis, but she does have a sneaky good matchup into the Fenrir. You don't have to use your ultimate to deal with the Brutalize. Again, Transgressor's Fate, drop it at your feet. Now Fenrir is just off of you, walk away. Uh, best case scenario, use that Vengeful Assault, get a little bit of additional movement speed as well. It's more so about this Fafnir. How well are they going to be able to just run it down, land those hammers, find the Sunders, and then get that ranged damage through? So far, Leviathans don't have much ranged damage. It almost feels like these teams are kind of swapping frontline choices because we see a lot of Fafnir at times for the Bolts. We see a lot of Yamoja at times for the Leviathans. But this Fenrir pick as well, Miv, I, I kind of want to emphasize this a little bit more. Do you think that that is going to be a, a definitive pick for Pan Item in the jungle, or do you think that that has potential to go solo? It has potential to go all sorts of places, right? We could even see it potentially inside of support. We haven't seen Wrong You run it too often, but that is the flex potential that Fenrir brings. It means that maybe we see Fafnir solo. I think that is pretty unlikely, so. Panatom probably going to be the one piloting this god, and I think that it fits his playstyle incredibly well, especially considering how good of a matchup he has into gods like Yamojo or even this Osiris, that Ragnarok ultimate, going to be very hard to deal with. And with the Merlin now being locked in play, it seems as the Leviathans are going to make sure that Shikto has his god choice before that final pick comes through, so that's uh, potential for a definitive counter pick opportunity no way. for the Leviathans. Would not expect Benenu to want to prioritize the Alpwash here, although Jean Cui has been up in the air and in a He's lot on a of win discussions. He's on a win streak right now. I, that's the thing, Mifflin, is that I, I feel as though this could potentially be a, a strong Jean Cui option here for the Bolts, and given the fact that there have been so many mages banned away, I, I don't know if we've ever seen a set with this many mages being focused out. No, but it doesn't have to be Apwash. It doesn't have to be Jean Cui. We've it's seen the Vulcan. the Vulcan get locked in, or maybe Ven goes back to one of his best picks inside of the Morrigan. And this is a game that I think he can really perform on this god. There's not a lot of great ways for the Leviathans to deal with the stealth, and there's not a great ways for them to really find him, except for the Gallarhorn Ultimate. You got that old TF2 kind of interaction where going to the stealth is Morrigan, and uh, Gallarhorn just kind of 360 spinning around you, hopefully find one tick and knock her outside of the stealth. But outside of that, great transformation options in the early game could turn into Osiris or King Arthur, even into the Artemis to help out around these neutral objectives. I think this is a very good game for it. But my concern so far for the Bolts is the consistency of their damage and how execution heavy this draft is. And do you want to elaborate a little bit more on that for me? Because I, I kind of get what you're saying between the Artemis and the Morrigan, but do you feel as though Morrigan can definitely close the gap there in that consistency? I think that she could close gap onto the enemy team for sure. Merlin's going to have to keep his head on a, on a pivot, making sure that Venenu isn't able to work his way forward. But this CC core that the Leviathans have already, Fafnir, Fenrir, Nauka Cullen as well, all very good gods at just diving in and making sure that the Morgan isn't allowed to act as that solo agent inside the back line. But when I say that the Bolts have a high execution draft, take a peek at their CC across the board. Caledonian Boar might be one of their most consistent tools, and after you hit that first target, you can just kill the boar. I mean, it's not going to be able to work its way through an entire team fight. And outside of that, you've got Sickle Slow from Osiris, a 
pretty hard to land stun on Yamoja and then just King Arthur with a couple of bits of single target CC. So when it comes to the compositions overall, then would you expect that the Bolts to be the primary initiators for a lot of these team fight engagements, or is this a composition that you look more for the counter engage with? I think the Bolts, and this is kind of just reminiscent of the Bolts as a whole, they're going to be looking for the counter engage. These guys love looking for that counter punch. They'll likely show up onto these objectives just trying to generate some threat, force the Leviathans to engage onto them, back up, burn through some of those resources on the side of Leviathans, utilize the healing from 408, and then re-engage. That seems to be the generalized strategy that they've brought to the last couple of their sets. And have to ask, given the fact that Yarkor is so new back, well, not necessarily new to the solo lane, but, you know, it has been a decent amount of time. He's still, I think, trying to really gear up into the, the play style because solo from ADC definitely feels like a, a little bit of a difference between those side lanes. And when you look at this Kakolin versus the King Arthur matchup, would you still expect that the Kakolin could have a lot of early lane pressure? Or do you think that this matchup is still shifted a little bit more towards King Arthur's favor? I think that this matchup is dictated by the first five levels. If Kakolin is able to utilize that rage stance, just get involved very early on, find that early poke. If he pulls a lead, even hits level six uh, around the time King Arthur's level five, there's not many ways for King Arthur to fight his way back in. But just telling the full truth here, it's generally going to be a 5-5 five -five matchup. This is a lane matchup that we've seen a lot in the past. King Arthur and Kakulin have teed up against each other a fair bit of times, and generally, it's not about the solo kill. It's about which one of these guys is able to establish dominance around the totem Aku and then start to rotate out and involve themselves in a 3v3. And then synergy-wise, do you expect the Leviathans to be at a slight disadvantage here in comparison to the Bolts, given the fact that they have had a couple of role swaps take place? I mean... I guess you would kind of have to say so, right? I mean, the Bolts have been playing together all year, and the Leviathans just got this new ADC. They had to move your core back over into the soul lane, but I trust these guys. They, they've got a very definitive game plan. Nobody's going to say the Leviathans has tricked them inside of an SPL game. So when you have that sort of hard slate and stone strategy, if you would, it means that it's easy to operate on. Zatman has played against the Leviathans. He's going to show up and say, this is what they did against me. I'm just going to try and fit into that. Exactly. I think that Zapman may be able to provide a little bit of insight here for the Leviathans, given that he did have the opportunity to play them, or excuse me, the Bolts, once already. But we've got Game 1 in studios from the Olympus Bolts between the Olympus Leviathans, and we've got Dolson and Gormizer. Take it away for the cast. That's right, Taco. Thank you. Mifflin as well on the desk. Dolson and Gormizer will bring us into Game Number 1 between the Olympus Bolts and the Atlantis Leviathans. Back in studio, baby, and Doug will be working the camera for us still. Awesome. Jake and wrong you. Don't you just kind of want to see a little, a little subtle? Who? All right, so this is like assault status, right, Gore? If one of them throws out damage, it's just karma for the rest of the game. Well, Jake did throw out an auto, did connect the auto by, I think, Let's generic rules. That does mean that the bolts are going to win. Yeah, player damage. <laughs> He's rocking it, baby. Top of the charts. Awesome, Jake. No one's gonna catch him. Awesome, Jake has had more time on top of the damage charts than any other player in this game so far. Gore, let, let's. Those are my favorite kind of stats. The like, this is very useless, but I'll frame it in a way that it sounds it's really good. It's a big impressive. one. Look, Awesome Jake, the way he plays this Yamoja, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised to see some damage on the charts as this game goes on. Right off the bat, Gore, I start to look at builds and, and, and star item choices going into a game like this because the Olympus Bolts, the Leviathans, you know, we, we've discussed it pretty handily on the desk. Admittedly, the first thing that jumps out to me here is not so much that Venenu's playing the Morgan, because this is a pick that Venenu's done yeah. very well on in the past. That he's gone so there's a mannequin yeah. on the Morgan. So for those of you who, who didn't know, this item, I believe, was like banned until very recently. Like The most recent patch had the fix for it. And so I was kind of thinking, maybe we'll see one, maybe we'll see maybe. two, maybe in the jungle makes sense. We've, we that's where two. we saw it before. We've got two of them, but I didn't expect Vin to get it. But it kind of makes sense where Morgan's damage is going to be. It's all in that setup. It matches well with the Osiris. I'm curious about the early game. I feel like Vin and Lazbar are going to be trying to get extra aggressive. I would love to see that, wouldn't you? And that's how the Bolts kind of play in this early game. I think Lazbar's had a, a more proactive year up to this point so far. The talking point, of course, has been Lazbar's having a much better Season 8 than he did in Season 7, and that talking point still stands. But it's been talked, uh, I, I think, over and over again. Now it's really about the... the the presence of mind and the way he's able to get aggressive. And you kind of need to when you have this mannequins in the early yeah. game. So we'll see what Lazbar is able to do. On the other side, though, Gore Panatom has some early pressure himself as well here with <laughs> the Fenrir, Fenrir on his side. <laughs> you, you hit level 5, and that's when you expect to see the Ragnarok start to roll around this map. Downside is 
Plenty of individual peel in the ultimates between Barracuda and Jake and, and even Haddix. Also five sets of beads. Yeah, Vin is probably going to be the one that suffers, quote unquote, the most. Has his beads, though, so shouldn't necessarily be too worried about it. Has a lot of transformations as well. I mean, it's an awkward thing to do, but if Finrear is coming at you in Ragnarok, you could also turn to Finrear and then Ragnarok at him as well. You get CC immunity in that. Just turn into somebody that has the CC immunity somewhere, and I think it opens up a lot of the conversation for Vin. But I'm actually really worried about it because if Panatom does go in, the beads get used. The turnaround potential yep. for the bolts well, that's is what like massive, right? I mean, Lazbra, Vin, especially with mannequins, like you've got the God of Slows and Osiris, you've got stun and setup and damage follow up from Vin. It is a very dangerous two, like I, what twosome, I guess, to, to jump in on. And worth mentioning that Venenu, even not defensively, can transform into that Fenrir if he wants, and can maybe even find a Ragnarok or a pick of his own here. Wrong you starts off with the Sunder here. Awesome Jake into the bead. So Gore, you, you look at this duo lane. We've been following it back and forth a little bit. No real advantage pushed one way yeah. or another. One level lead though, that's worth noting. Maybe maybe just under a one level lead is that man wrong you tick over to level four. But with the Sunder and that hammer, you figure there still should be some pressure pushing up against Barracuda, but I don't know what the, the, the power scale looks like of this Heimdall versus the Artemis. It could be an interesting lane to follow along. I think with. it's it's much easier if Jake isn't there or isn't Yamoja, right? Like I, Because Yamoja's there, it's just like, man, Artemis, especially when she hits five, like Tusky's going to be available, but the traps are there. You've got a slow. You've got a, a quote-unquote decent escape and that you can give yourself some move speed, but it's going to come in handy here against Jake. Wow, Jake takes some good damage. That man ticking away on the Yamoja. That'll take the Riptide back to safety. So awesome Jake's safe, but very low and, and literally empty on Omi yeah. for the time being. So we'll receive a little bit of healing passively. Panatom was rotating on over here towards the left, but Jake and Barracuda will head on back to base. Probably the right call here, uh, given the state of your health and, and your Omi there for Jake. Yeah, I'm interested to watch how Jake translates now, if he's going to go back to duo. Seems like that's exactly the path he's going to take. Might just be going to clean up a green buff, get some extra farm, or clear this wave. But it's that transition when they go back towards mid that I think is really going to escalate for Rong Yu, right? I think he's going to be able to start stepping up a lot more, become maybe more of a threat in terms of where he's going to be able to apply that Sunder. He's going to be much more often matched up with Lazbra, with Jake as well. And in that case, I, I want that Sunder 10 times out of 10. Now, Gore, this is interesting. If we continue along with some early game builds, it's kind of fun. We don't often get to, to dissect stuff so early on in yeah. the game because Most either of the there's killing the happening same. or the builds, <laughs> builds start to get a little bit more set at this point. Venenu looking like, not even looking like, will be going into that Doom Orb yeah. first overall, which is something that saw a lot of popularity in, in the closing months of Season 7. Admittedly, I don't even know if Season 8 it's really seen all that much play. On the other side, an item that started to see some rise in play as well is this Pythag's piece. So both mid laners going for something that could synergize well, but a little bit unique maybe from the uh, the standard that we've seen. Yeah, and I don't know which one I want to jump into. It's again, it's kind of like you're at a buffet and there's just so many delicious foods in front of you. Like the mannequin sucker plus the doom orb there for Venenu. That combo to me is very frightening to go up against. That should be a very large power spike. It should be a, a lot to have to deal with. And again, after after what we talked about, having the slows coming down from Lazbra, eventually you add in the stun from Jake. That feels like a wombo combo set for the day for the bolts to be able to just clean yep. up the mid lane. But Shinto, admittedly, maybe not something that you would harp onto when you're looking at Pythagoras. He's like, oh yeah, there's the lifesteal that Panatom's going to get, or Rong Yu's going to get, or uh, just Shinto himself is going to get. The pin, that's always cool. I'm actually looking at the health. If I'm looking to survive <laughs> a Mannequin Scepter, Doom War, <laughs> Morrigan on one side, yep. I want that 200 health. It's just a little bit, but it's enough to maybe eat one more auto, maybe a couple, to make sure that you're not really going to be as stressed out early on, and maybe give them some early game survivability, as well as some good late game scaling. Where did we first start seeing Pythags? Was it... Did somebody... Somebody built it on Giannis, I think, earlier on here in Season 7. Maybe maybe it was uh, one of the Giannis players that we, we started to see it, but Merwin now gets thrown into that category as well, so we'll keep track of Shinto's build and Vamp Shroud on the Merlin, so wonder where uh, where his mindset will be with the rest of that build, and, and that's something we'll keep a little bit of track of here. Neither jungler have really shown much face on into the lanes just yet, both pretty happy, Gore, with just kind of one, two punching one another on the uh, on the rotations, making sure they gobble up all the farm there for themselves. And the pace of the game is something that we would normally say the Leviathans feel very comfortable with, right? Yeah. This is the type of game where, where you, you, you kind of ease into it, we, we play our game and the team fights, and, and of course we've talked about how, as of late, 
they, they've become a more multifaceted team instead of just a late game team, and, and I think that's still a very fair point. But the Olympus Bolt's probably happy as well, given their recent play styles. We'll see if uh, King Arthur will commit onto this blue buff. He will not. Olympus Bolt's probably not super uncomfortable in this position where the game is taking a bit of a slower pace. Yeah, this is a matchup where, honestly, you, know, you throw this last year, have this team, the Bolts, the way they've been playing, and this Leviathan's roster, or, honestly, even if you go into last year, you put Netroid there, or if you can just clone Hardcore and have them be solo and carry. Either way, I don't necessarily think it matters who's over there. It's just so interesting to see the matchups one by one because a lot of the play styles here are similar. I mean, especially with the right. way that they end up coming through in a lot of these late-game team fights. I expect a lot, especially Ooh, in the mid lane. Finally, some action here in the mid lane. Panatom transforms, uses the Ragnarok, waiting to find a target. Won't get it, but there's enough damage on the back end. But Venenu transforms as well into the Osiris. He'll leap on in, but won't end up getting the last bit of damage onto Panatom. So everyone survives here. And you have to look at the ultimates, what are down. Transformation and Lord of the Afterlife down for Ven and Lazbro, respectively. And then, uh, and then over on the other side, Panatom used his ult there. Zapman nearly gets taken down. By awesome Jake, didn't use his ultimate there, but they're going to be able to push him out, get a little gold, get a little XP in the lane while Zapman has to leave. And that seems it's so small, right? There's no first blood, no big kills that transition over, and it, it's one of those things that it's so easy to come back from, but this actually might be a bad spot for Rongyu. Rongyu's alone here. This is just Rongyu. Yeah. Zapman is going to come back from base here, but now Rongyu just eating tons of damage Slow. here. And the auto attacks from Barracuda nearly get the kill. Barracuda stuns down Husky. Zapman. And then there's a River's Rebuke. That's a head scratcher of a play where Rongyu goes in alone and then has to leave. And then Zapman goes in alone. Yeah, I feel uh, there was just some mistiming with the communication. I think Rongyu thought Zap was going to be there faster. And then when Zap gets in, thinking that Rongyu maybe has a little bit more health than he does, ultimately ends up butting heads, losing one life. Could have been two, though, so it's not the end of the world. But now things are going to get a little more out of hand in the sense that there's a, a much more significant lead towards the Bolts, being able to capture that kill. Yeah, you burn Tusky, you burn the, the River's Rebuke, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. They burn both ults yep. on the side of the Leviathan duo lane as well and so it's a big win Jake notably is going to be missing his beads which makes it easier for Panatom to come over there and maybe balance the fates out but this is a comfortable lead for the Bolts to, to start building on so far the pace of this game as you had highlighted both of these teams comfortable but when you've got 1300 to 1500 gold in your pockets that, that's ahead you're definitely going to be able to start applying pressure onto purple buffs blue buffs maybe start looking towards these neutral objectives Bolts like to go for that that pyromancer so maybe it's going to be a few minutes before we see anything right. they tend to, to air towards him first since it's not the end of the world if you lose that versus a Gold Fury. And then we might see, you know, some Jagger pushes a Gold Fury push in the, in the next five minutes. And the Olympus Bolts now can choose to push a little bit further here in the dual lane. If they want for the next 45 seconds, that man's beads are down. Admittedly, you know, they're, they're what? Uh, 60 seconds, so maybe a full minute offset from what Awesome Jake had to, uh, to or when Awesome Jake had to burn his beads there. So, that man, I don't think, had his beads into that fight. Did use his ultimate. Uh, but there is a small window for the next 30 seconds if you want to try to doubly punish this Heimdall. Could be there. But Zapman probably smart enough to stay alive. You do have to be a little bit concerned here about this Tier 1 tower on left for the Leviathans. Gore, you call the Pyromancer out and the Olympus Bolts. Go for it. And that'll be another little bit of gold fused into their pocket. But you can kind of get the sense of, of where all this pressure has been pushing and where the Leviathans want to counter some pressure. And right now it's Panatom who wants to counter some out. Wrong, you will use the transformation into Ragnarok on a Jake who doesn't have beads. Tusky flies on through what? and then the River's Rebuke is going to put okay. Jake right in striking distance. But it's Wrong, you who picks up the kill. And that is well executed, not dies, but gank there by Panatom. And just recognizing, we know where the beads are down. We know it's going to be Jake. River's Rebuke and Tusky Burn for that as well. You might not kill Barra, but you get exactly what you came and set out to do. And that's going to be, again, not a monumental swing, but he's got to level up on Rong Yu. It's some experience that is necessary for the Leviathans. And at least in terms of kill equity, makes things feel a lot more balanced than the numbers up top. The, the fact is, though, that the gold is, is getting maybe a little more out of hand for the Leviathans. Killing off Jake is not not as worthwhile as killing off someone like Zapman. And so I think they're going to be looking for a little bit more. I just say keep your eyes on that Finrear, especially whenever yep. that diamond is full. It's, it's almost back for Banatom. Once he has that ult available, that's really where I want to see him start getting aggressive. And I think Vin, uh, and, well, he has his beads, but still could be an easy target. Well, Gore, we wondered if maybe Zapman would get double punished while his beads were down. And I turned an eye to, to Awesome Jake, whose beads were burnt in the, in the fight that the Olympus Bolts had won there. And so Panatom able to get in. Get the Ragnarok off, and you can see uh, the single tar target damage 
flowing through from that point on. The graph showed us just a minute ago, still about a 1,500 gold lead here for the Olympus Bolt, so they're feeling somewhat comfortable still with the state of the game. The only big level discrepancy is over there for Barracuda, who's got the one level lead, but still 2,000 XP spread maybe somewhat evenly across the rest of this map here, so that's something to look forward to as well. Shinto build update, Gort sticking with the lifesteal. Pythag's piece into yeah. a little bit more there with that second item. Admittedly, maybe still a bit unconventional for what we've seen out of the Merlin. Yeah, look, I, I'm looking to... Uh, first off, Pythag's piece has been picked up a few times on, what, Yanis lately? And that, that's kind of been the only real big grasp for it, although we're starting to see it in a, a few more builds, maybe over the next couple of weeks that expands. But Typhon's Fang has not been hanging around. Granted, I will say Lifesteal, so you're getting Magical Lifesteal off Pythag's Beast. Typhon's Fang enhances that, so you're already going to be getting 30% yep. more. Your Magical Power is then increased, as you can see down at the bottom there, by twice the amount of Magical Lifesteal you have, and, and that could come in handy here. Wow, another gank happening over here on the duo lane side. It's Lazbro who's still here, so this is a 3v3. Shinto will make it a 4v3 if there was any more commitment, but there is not. So Lord of the Afterlife used there by Lazbra. And Zatman had used his ultimate there as well. Out of all concern, though, Gore, this is always kind of the give and take with these types of builds. And Merlin may not need it, depending on how much power ends up fusing into that build. Concerned about a lack of CDR in the first couple items? Not so much. I think it could be a big difference, could but I here. don't think it's going to hurt. Could help around this Gold Fury here as the bolts have started it up. Wrong, you leaps over the wall. River's Rebuke is up from Awesome Jake, oh. and it's locked Panatop right into place. And wow. Havix rotates in. And the first kill of the fight goes to the bolts, and the second will do the same. Yarkor wreaking havoc in the back line, though, as he'll shoulder his Jeez. way on in. It's a big three man stagger there from Yarkor, but not enough as Lazbra notches another. And Shinto, look, you're, you're getting out of there by the skin of your teeth just barely. That is a clean three pickup for the Bolts, and realistically it comes from leashing that Gold Fury, right? They recognize that they have an advantage here, they've been just enough in the lead that they've been able to leverage it, and that's just capitalizing on great team fight ults, right? You've got Jake, that River's Rebuke perfectly slices it up, even though Hardcore is able to come in and disrupt a couple of things. The damage output that is coming on the side of the Bolts, which I'm going to go ahead and throw out. Three stacks now on that Charon's coin, which was picked up. A yep. really big power spike to begin with for Venenu. But, I mean, the way Barra plays that, you can see him skyrocketing to the top of the player damage charts. A lot of that comes from the Artemis. He just has Aussie and Ikeval online. It's not really his quote-unquote power spike. Wow, Zatman took a little bit of damage here, but now Awesome Jake with no Omi and very low health is going to try to run away. There's a minion wave there to maybe find some safety. Barracuda just wailing away on the purple buff, but Barra doesn't have any mana either, so Zatman gets a free kill over onto Awesome Jake, and that, that's exactly what the Leviathans need here, this gold lead has jumped on up to, to just shy of 5,000. If there's some hope here, Gore, for the Leviathans, because this is not the type of lead that the Bolts tend to fumble away. If there's some hope, it's things like that, where this Heimdall yeah. can reach that late game point a little bit quicker. And we talked about it a lot last year. We haven't said it as much recently, but it is something that I think still holds true. The Leviathans, look, 4,000, 5,000 gold down. They still feel more than comfortable taking team fights. A lot of it was that five-on-five -five synergy. That's what we talked about so much last year, and even earlier this year, it felt like it was still there. We'll have to see if Zap can translate into that the same way we've seen some of these others. Barra seems to think that he can take this. Look, this is wow. the matchup he might have been that is to. as old as pretty much the SPL. I mean, Barra yeah. and Zap have been going at it. This is nothing new for them. But I'm curious to see how they translate into these team fights specifically, because at the end of the day, that trade, the Leviathans, like you said, you get a tier 1, 500 gold. You kill off Jake, that's a little bit in your pocket as well. But a tier 1 plus your support for a Gold Fury and a 3 sweep, like that's perfectly fine for the Bolts. Yeah, the Bolts have built on that early lead. Wondered if Barracuda would send out Tuskies. That man didn't have his ult or his beads. But that's a, that's a lot of investment there for Bear on an immobile character like the Artemis. You need that for the real scenarios when you need a little extra escape. Pyromancer started up by the Leviathans. It is spotted, or by the Bolts, excuse me, is spotted out by the Leviathans, but it was really only Lasbra putting damage in. Now Yarkor trying to control that back line as Venenu and Lasbra oh, both wow. take a little bit of damage. But look at the River's Rebuke. It's perfect. It's one target, but it's given the kill on over to the Bolts, and there was nobody close by for the Leviathans. And it seems like something that should be an insignificant kill, but that lockdown specifically killing off someone like Harkor makes it so much more difficult for the Leviathans to engage. I mean, Panatom Look at his build. He's a little tanky, but not anywhere near as much as he would want. And he's three levels down on Lasper. That's going to make it so much easier for the Bolts. Wow, the Olympus Bolts are able to regroup here as well. Panatom, he's got to leave. I'm not sure he can rejoin this fight. There's going to be some life steal in there. That'll get this Fenrir back to maybe a bit of a healthier state. Now it's finally Pyromancer doubled back for the Leviathans. were showing some face, maybe considering a steal, which could still happen. But Rongyu zoned out by Haddix. 
And so ultimately, Gore, it's, the, it's these objectives plus kills that are starting to really skyrocket this lead for the Bolts, because we didn't see much in the way of invades. We saw a gank or two right over to the duo lane, but it's been the play since the laning phase has kind of faded away that have given the Bolts this big lead, and the lead is big. It's over 5,000 now. I mean, uh, look, you've got two, I would argue, two signature picks. I think we memed about it, and, and you go back to the Scarabs day, uh, the media day. Zatman, who was there because he, at the time, was on the Scarabs. Yep. Man, not even a week ago that was able to come through. And they were talking about the fact that specifically Jake on Yamoja, while last year wasn't a big deal, this year has been absolutely problematic for them, and I think this is a, a good showcase of that. He has been getting so many great and crucial ults, and that's just one part of the mix. I think Venenu, especially just because of what we've seen on this The Morgan play over the last year, a few years, honestly, even, you can expand it even further, it is those two are signature picks. Lasbra, I don't know if we played the clip for it or if I just got to see it because it was on our, our production Discord, but Lasbra had some of the funniest comms last week playing this Osiris yep. jungle, but it's something that I think is Half really... Half of that was bleeped, if I remember correctly. <laughs> yes, right. and that's what made it so funny to me. But I, I think it's just the, the synergy they have in their core three. I mean, Bear, come on, Bear's been playing Artemis since Artemis was existent. Right. So this is something that I think all fits in. King Arthur's one of Haddix's favorite and best gods. Like, this is just a really, really comfortable team for the Bolts. And Doug, you were you're hovered on it for a minute there. The, uh, the net worth charts, I think, tell a pretty interesting story here where the Olympus Bolts, you know, the, you, you expect it where they're going to be up towards the top. Panatom has had a, had a tough game, not only getting involved, but apparently farming here. He's two levels oh, wow. behind Lasbra. He's bottom of the damage charts by two, or excuse me, net worth charts by 200 to wrong you. And then you got to look for the counterpart. Where's the Osiris? 10,400 gold. Call it 2,000 gold ahead of wrong you is, uh, is Lasbra here. It feels like this Osiris has just had so much more impact, and maybe that's pretty indicative as to why. This one looks like it'll fizzle out, though, with uh, Awesome Jake playing Barricade. Wrong you though, gets Rivers rebuked on in. He'll have to transform here as the walls crash on down. There's a stun on the follow-up as well. Wow. Barracuda deletes him for the killing spree. I mean, just all of the burst damage. I, it felt kind of fruitless. Again, you see the Rivers rebuke go up. You go, okay, ult for ult. You, you get the one out of wrong you. That burning that coerce feels great early on, although Rivers rebuke's pretty good in a team fight. And then just out of nowhere, I mean, I guess it's, it's honestly, it's Barra's damage. Artemis, the best thing about her is whenever you pop your stim, you're going to get even more bonus damage out of, of your Silver Branch bow. So you're feeling pretty solid yeah, throughout okay. all of this. And he has just been able to bring so much. I mean, look at that. He's 8141 in terms of damage highest in the, the game. And you had memed it. We had, I was, we were joking about it. But Jake's number two. Jake, Jake look, he's uh, over a thousand damage behind, but he is hovering up there in terms of player damage. Right. If the difference is 27 <laughs> damage, then we can have the conversation. But it's not 27 damage. It's Ragnarok onto Jake in the back. Should be a kill for the Leviathans, and it is to start off this fight. Haddock's getting whittled away as well. Venenu hasn't had the opening to get in this fight. Barracuda doing his best to kite backwards. It's the best looking fight so far for the Leviathans. They get a clean pick. They force Lasbra out. They nearly get a kill onto Haddock's as well. That's a big defense that the Tier 1 does fall. Lasbra, a, a stiff breeze would have killed him there, and that yeah. is just unfortunate that Leviathan's were able to get barely see his health on the <laughs> The good thing is they got wow. the bolts completely big out of there. Advantage. This is a good way to engage onto the fire job. Lasbra has now gone back to base. Haddix is full health, but he's going to have to come back from base as well. Venenu is here, but might have been spotted out, is spotted out by that ward. So is Barracuda. Barra does not have ultimate. Venenu does. And so it's half HP on the Fire Giant. Wrong you is splitting this one up. The rest of the reinforcements from the Bolts starting to come back from base. But Awesome Jake won't be alive in time. Venenu transforms. He's into the Artemis, but gone before my eyes as Panatom grabs that kill with Haddix is returned and Lazaro has as well. It's a three kill swing. The Olympus Bolts don't steal away the FG. The Leviathans secure it and they have got to get out with these and three buffs. And blink was just used by Lazaro. He has no way to engage his ults down. He just has to slow him and chase him down. And the Arcor is beneath his tier two tower here. It looks like Shinto is just going to secure the escape path. Now it's a numbers game. 30 seconds remaining on Panatom and Zatman. 30 seconds on Venenu as well. And so tier two seems to be the answer. The Leviathan score, they, they remain three strong on that FG buff after the kills that came uh, came at the end of it. I think if I'm the Bolts here, I start to push down mid, that tier two. You've got a minion wave right there, maybe a little too dangerous now. They've kind of separated Stripping the steel away a lot the jungle. Of jungle. Yep. But then left also has a pretty hefty minion wave for them. I think there's a lot of rotationary power for them to, to kind of control this map with everything they have. Despite losing the Fire Giant, still a good fight for them. But I do think, at least going to the fight beforehand, you get to see a little bit more, specifically out of Panatom. He's 1-2-2, two, and two, still two levels down. But once that Contagion was finished, first off, the anti-heal massively helped a lot of that. 
Yep. But now he's got a lot more protection, specifically against Lazbra and Barra, who have been doing a lot of it towards him, to make sure that he can get in and engage at least a little bit longer. Still maybe not as tanky as he would like or not as survivable as he would like because of the level deficit, but able to make sure that his presence is felt. That made that fight around that tier 2 for the Leviathans feel a lot stronger. But unfortunately, I just don't think they were expecting the amount of power the bolt swung back with around the FG. And like we, we have, of course, the, the hindsight of being able to break down that fight and knowing how things turned out. But how about that call from the Leviathans? They ultimately get one kill, but then they knock out two members of the Olympus bolts that have to go back to base w with low HP, right? Remember Haddox and Lazbra had to go back. They effectively had to run all the way back into the fight. We wondered how this team would synergize. Granted, it's only Zapman that's, that's added to the squad here this week. So, yeah. so the core... Still remains there. the same, but that's a quick call. That, that is a very fast call that requires good, uh, concise teamwork, and the Leviathan's, of course, a team that, that's known to have that. You get one kill down, a couple targets low, and immediately to the FG. Not as clean as you would have liked, but you yeah. still got it on three people, Gore, for, uh, for a minute and 50 seconds. It's one of those moments where the perfect fight, with how low Haddix and Lazbro were, the perfect fight, those two die, you get that for Fire Giant for free. For free Everybody right. has it. Luckily, like Shinto having it, I think is still going to be good for you in the middle of these fights. Having it on Hardcore and Wrong Yu, that means that you're going to have a lot of sustain, at least in your front line. But losing it on Zapman means it's a little Ooh. harder to get through the five Could towers still remaining there on the bolts. But Never Zap, mind. especially with this kind of build, shouldn't have too much trouble with it. And he's even going in on Lazbar right yeah, now. Yeah, this is an interesting rotation here. The Leviathans were over by the tier, tier 1 tower over in the solo lane. The Olympus bolts in the meantime push up to the tier 2 tower on left. Could be a meeting of the minds here around the Leviathans red buff. And it's Panatom who's left alone. He gets stunned on in, uses the beads, leaps back onto Venenu, who will use the beads of his own. He's backpedaling as best he can. Jake provides some peel with the river's review. Panatom leaps on away as Lazbra tried to close that gap just a little bit further. Venenu's been alone here, but he's in the Osiris. He's tanky enough to stay alive. It's a leap away from Rongyu, and somehow Gourmizer, everyone's alive, but Zapman alone he's in the back. He's alone, just absolutely isolated. You can see the Bifrost Crystal. That's down. The bolts are sharks in the water, and they smell the blood. It's just how long Zapman can stay out of here. Aussie <laughs> passive going. Ooh, I honestly thought Barra. he was going to try to hit the Draugr to get some healing. That's smart from Barra here. Backpedal away, because that would be the only saving grace there if, if Zapman was able to walk forward and end up getting the kill cool. onto Barra. That is wild. We, the we, crystal just came up. You can see up. it just <laughs> came up towards the end of it there. You could tell, right? That was a very telegraphed, not by either team necessarily, but, but we could see on the map the two teams closing in towards one another. That was a very quick transformation by, by Venenu. He found yeah. himself alone in the back there, transformed into the Osiris, and then extra tankiness kept him in the fight a little bit longer. It's that that weird juggle, right? We saw him try to transform into the Artemis earlier. He got absolutely melted before yeah, he, he was could do anything. Maybe that was the lesson learned, right? It's like, hey, I could do a lot of damage like Barra, but it comes at the expense of being as squishy as Barra. It is easy to kill off an Artemis in that circumstance. Or you can change the Osiris, like we just saw Lazarus been able to output a pretty good chunk of damage, maybe not the, the most insane amount in the game, but it's put them in a position where, like you said, tanky enough to not only disengage, but really control that fight. And it separates the Leviathans. It pulls Zap completely isolated while the rest are pushed under their, their tier two slash Phoenix line in mid. And it opens up the Bolt's opportunity to, to collapse in on Zap there. And as much as I like to highlight it, like I'd mentioned the Aussie maybe trying to use the passive, get a couple of shots on the Draugr to get some healing. There's only so much you can do there if you're Zap. You, you're just trying to buy as much time until that crystal comes up and hope yep. that you could get it off. And, and unfortunately, the Bolts were just prepared for it. Is that man not a bad game by any means? Third on the damage charts, top on his team, 2-3-2. Two, and two. A KDA that's not necessarily indicative of the, the pressure that Zapman's been able to put out, but there's been a lot of dive put onto Zap and was 2-2-2 two, two, and two before Zap was a bit caught out on his own there. Lazar has this Witchblade here. That might be uh, sort of indicative then of what Lazar's looking to do, jump in on Zapman, slow down that attack speed as much as you can, and uh, make that back line uncomfortable. Not much ends up coming to that first FG there, Gore, with a couple of the, uh, the members of the Leviathans going down immediately after. This one, though, Maybe the one that could could seal the deal for the Bolts or maybe for the Leviathans, depending on which team is able to secure it cleaner. I mean, that's a, a hefty Fire Giant to start, and you can see Barra, he's holding onto it, but Whoa. you want to get engaged. The River's Review card he used, I want to see him go in. And it separated the fight, but Jake has taken half of his HP in return. Panatom has already used the Ragnarok and didn't get anyone with it. This is the Leviathans backing away. They want a second wind against the team of second wins, and the Olympus Bolts happy to give them that opportunity. Panatom's alt down, Jake's is as well. 
That's the only big difference maker. I'm looking at the Tusky, I'm looking at Venenu. They're gonna go in on Vin! Oh, Vin, he's gotta transform here to get out of the fight. He does it. The Osiris once more. The Hardcore considering a chase down, but instead, there's more priority targets over by the FG. All the front line low now for the Olympus Bolt. Lazarus in behind. As that Osiris oh, could Panadol. make some damage in the back line. Look at Tusky ripping through! Big stuns on the front! Oh, are you kidding me? The unluckiness, I, oh, that is devastating there, Gore. All right, so, so we take a little pause here. And what would I'm be. trying to remember where everyone a, was standing, all those health bars. It feels like a what happens next moment. Yeah. Well, what I saw was, was Tusky flying on through, mm -hmm. stunning what felt like everyone for the Leviathans there. Yeah. Oh, that is just, that is difficult. <laughs> this is going to be a master class in casting if it, if it comes immediately back into that. And we got we to gotta pick it up right where it was. It, an important, though, team fight there, Gore, and, and what still is a team fight yeah. uh, on the back end of this break, because it, it felt, or on the back end of the pause, because it felt like the Leviathans had a little push in the front of it, and then Barracuda joins and might, we'll have to wait and see, uh, flip things around. I think the other key is watching Vin. That transformation's already down. He's still yep. there at about half health, this which is a, is a very, it's like a good spot to try and push back as the Morgan. Also a very dangerous spot to try and yep. push back in the morning. I didn't see before the pause went through where his relic situation was, but I imagine already having your ult forced out, you're not necessarily feeling too confident and too comfortable in your ability to jump right back into the Leviathans. Yep. And a lot of the bolts were on the retreat. Outside of Tusky, there wasn't a whole lot of pushing forward, so the Leviathans had that fire giant pit control, and that makes things even more awkward for a re-engage. Yep. Now you're trying to get around the walls, you're trying to regroup, you're kind of separated into two sections, one on one side of, of the, the Harpy XP camp and then one kind of going around the other towards mid. And that can't really bode well for you if the nope. collapse in from the Leviathans just turns towards one. We saw the same thing happen to Zap earlier. It could be Vin, it could be Barra, it could be anybody on the bolts that kind of meet the receiving end of that one. This is such a unique... I, I think you're the one who's pitched the show a lot, like what happens next yeah, when we get to sit pause down the and... team fight. Well, that's literally what we're going to get to do here, Gormizer. The pause. About to unpause here, and the Fire Giant team fight resumes with Fenenu getting rid of Shinto. So now there's two members down for the Leviathans, but Awesome Jake, low HP as well. But the Leviathans are all split up, and it looks like the Bolts are going to be able to run them on down. One kill return, wow. but Fenenu makes it a double before he goes to the grave. It's a deicide for the Olympus Bolts, and it'll be FG as well. And I thought the separation was going to be worse for the Bolts, but they were the ones driving the Leviathans apart there. You could see, I mean, Zatman just absolutely, again, once again, isolated, cornered. He had the crystal, but the timer on that one. One. Didn't work for him. Unfortunately, you know Vin in that pause menu is looking at Shinto just right down the barrel and knows exactly where he's going to go. And you just pointed out to me, beads and Agus up there for Shinto. Maybe yep. not prepared for that final hit. Or maybe he <laughs> recognized the futility of it. They spent the, what, minute there in the pause, and he's like, guys, I'm dead. Yeah, not There's no way to get around <laughs> this one. I I'm gone. Well, look at these death timers. So this is a unique position here for the Olympus Bolts. Ten Shinto's seconds. up in five. Rongyu's up in eight. Zatman will be up in... 10. Panatom is going to revive here as well. So Venenu's gone. And it looks like the 4v5 and the impending respawn's enough to make the Olympus Bolts turn away. But it's a mid lane Phoenix down here, Gore. That's very early on here in this Fire Giant power play. So the Bolts will have plenty of time. 3 minutes and 15 seconds from now to continue to push in. Could end the game on this FG. I mean, you've got no minions push up and left. They're, they're just barely outside your tier 2. Same thing on right, except just barely out of where the yeah, tier 1 used to exist. So you're going to spend time, you've got the enhanced buffs, grab those wherever you can. Then the question starts to become where you want to aggress and where they're going to push up. A lot of people tend to go and opt for left. Right's pushed up a little bit further, either or is going to work out well for him. Yeah, Barra's kind of carrying a whole lot of gold. He's going to upgrade it just at the gold. chin size. I think he upgraded his starter there. Maybe he already had that one. It should be a lot of wards as well as he drops all of that gold there. The purification up and Aegis upgrade, I believe, coming through. So y you have exactly what you want if you're Barra here. Oh, granted, a minute left before your Aegis is back, so maybe not exactly what you'd want. Wow. But very, very comfortable position. 6-0 and 6, by the way, on that Artemis. He's just having a good game. Look, I, and I, I want to give some shouts to Jake as well. Yeah, 6 6 looks fantastic for Barra. I think Jake has had pretty good Rivers Rebuke priority here this game. It, it's so easy yeah. to concern yourself with, oh, there's only one guy in this one, and, and it's not worth using it. But it, it, it feels like those picks have been worthwhile. The separations of the team fight even have been properly picked here from Jake. I, I think all the assists that aren't on the board, and he's only not participated in four kills here, not, not even necessarily indicative of the way that he's played. I, I think this Yemoja has looked fantastic in the hands of, uh, of Awesome Jake. The big 408 here in game number one needs some more of it here to get this Phoenix down.
I'm actually excited to see it. That's one of the things that makes Yamoja just so devastating in here. I was actually wondering if Vin was going to transform into Yamoja to have like the walls. double Rivers Rebuke. Although I like it's the like Osiris Vin diagram. <laughs> the Vin diagram. Oh, oh nice! Yeah. I didn't. That, that was even <laughs> intentional, of course. <laughs> well, Haddix is going in. Haddix is blinked into the back line. He's found Cheeto, and then Lasper's in a perfect spot to collapse. Bob Imaro, and once more here in this game, and the Leviathans. They're starting to crumble here on the back line, but it's a Ragnarok onto Haddix. That should be a kill on over, but Venado, he's going big here. It's a double for Ben. Barracuda gets two as well, and the Olympus Bolts take game one. I mean, that was crisp towards the end. There's that little bit of a flub. Look, the Leviathans had that great call. You had highlighted it. They win a really decent fight around their tier two, immediately yep. go over to the FG. But then they lose Zap, they lose Panatom, and it's like, you, you got the FG, you maintain the buff, but only on three. Is it yep. worthwhile? And the Bolts utilize that time to knock down at least one tier two. They might have gotten a second one during that push. I can't remember. Right. But I know they went and got a lot of neutral objectives and jungle <laughs> strippage because of that one. And it felt like that was the, the shining moment for the Leviathans, and they just weren't able to really make it be the true peak they wanted it to be. I mean, this Bolts team core, they are just so it's difficult so to good. play against, aren't they? I mean, this is just such a hard team to play against right now. Teams haven't gotten them figured out here yet in Phase 2, and the Bolts definitely haven't gotten them figured out, at least in Game Number 1. Still plenty more action between the Bolts and the Leviathans. Game Number 2, right after this.
my fans, and welcome back to the Smite Pro League, powered by Alienware. We're still getting started with this Atlantis Bolts versus Leviathan set in studio, but for you guys back at home that want to show some support to the Pro League itself, you can head on over to shop.smiteproleague.com. Make sure to cop some of this nice little hoodie apparel. We've got jerseys as well, representing all that Smite Pro League action from your living room and, you know, just while you're watching this in general. Maybe it'll help you game a little bit harder, given you could try and play like the pros if you're dressed like one. You can also wear the clothes outside. You don't just have to wear it in your living room. You can you can wear these anywhere. I, I, would I wear mine everywhere. I would not recommend the hoodie outside right now. Well, like for not? us, it's it's fine indoors. People don't realize how cold. I think we don't have Alaskan studios, fans. But oh, that's true. That's true. I that that was a little discriminatory of me. I'm, I apologize sincerely to all of our Alaskan fans out there in the chat right now. You could definitely wear these SPL hoodies outside. But Mifflin getting back on track here with the set itself. Atlantis Leviathan's actually going to fall to the Olympus Bolts here for game number one. And the score lines may be not as indicative of what was actually going wrong for the Leviathan's throughout this match. No, it looked to me like a whole lot of Caledonian boar diff. Uh, I mean, Barracuda rotated out of lane around 15 minutes in and was like, hey guys, I'm super strong. I deal a ton of damage and well, Zap's still trying to farm up. They gave an early lead to this Artemis, and they ran with it. The Olympus Bolts, I was concerned originally about their ability to execute on this draft because it's a somewhat CC light, but didn't really come up. When you're up four, 5,000 gold at the 17-minute mark, you don't really need a ton of CC to find your kills. Sometimes you just need a damage, and that was certainly something that Barracuda was able to provide with this Artemis choice. And not only that, but I feel as though the, the space separation as well, just so much chaos taking place for this Olympus Bolts roster because when you're dealing with the likes of a King Arthur, an Osiris, a Yamoja all running at you at once, for a lone Fafnir and even beneath them on the Fenrir, I just don't feel as though the Atlantis Leviathans was really able to toggle between all that chaos and disruption in team fights. Yeah, it felt like to me the Leviathans were putting a lot of emphasis on shutting down Ven, making sure he wasn't allowed to have as much fun as he would have liked. And well, when you're putting that much effort towards shutting down Ven, it creates a lot of space for Barracuda to do exactly this 24,000 damage top of the charts here I mean consistent play I saw it in the chat we talked about it in the green room can't be letting Barracuda get the the Artemis can't be letting anyone get the Artemis it seems right now Mifflin Bavera especially has certainly been making his mark with those boars the transgressor fates as well she just has so much shred potential that even against a relatively beefy front line like the Kakolin like the Fafnir it's still just not really enough so for picks and bans for game number two Mifflin would you like to see the Leviathans if they aren't in that first pick choice for themselves opt for that Artemis early on I think that they could definitely go towards the Artemis early or maybe just adjust it inside of the bands. I mean, the Leviathans, I think, have got a good strategy, and there were really good moments inside of that one. I mean, Zapman has a good performance. Yarkor finds a couple of opportunities to get involved as well. But while we're talking about Yarkor, I am seeing a little bit of that rust inside of the soul lane. He's still adjusting. He's not scared to get involved, which is what I was concerned about coming into it because playing a Hunter then becoming a Frontliner, it's one of the largest tonal shifts you can have in Smite. He doesn't have that. My man's not scared to get involved, but maybe a little bit more fear would be uh, well served. He's jumping in aggressively and getting caught out a little bit too much. It just doesn't seem as though Harcourt is actually able to capitalize on his aggressive instances because it just seems to be a little bit mistimed with the rest of this Leviathan's roster. The focus, I think, just a, a little bit all over the place, which isn't typical from the Leviathans at all. This is a team that I think usually looks very well coordinated, but again, with some of these new roster swaps taking place, Zatman being added to the roster, there's bound to be a, a few kinks to work out in the process. Still, I, I like the fact that Hardcore definitely did his job as far as maintaining his solo lane presence throughout that laning phase, and that's why I think we saw such a heavy shift of attention more towards that mid-duo side of the map. Yeah, and the Bolts really were the progenitors of that aggression. They said, look, this is where our lead is, this is where we want to play, and they continued to do so. Leviathans, though, do make some pivots inside of the bands. Yeah, Artemis was the problem, 24,000 damage, not going to argue with the stats. Let's go ahead and remove that one from the play field. But, again, this does leave a Fenrir opportunity out in the open here for the Leviathans. They could also look to try and solidify that Fafnir again, but it's Osiris. So a couple shots here at Lasbra 
on Leviathan. Seems as though they're tired of letting that Chop Chop intervene with that back line. Yeah, Lazarus' best picks right now, Osiris, Gilgamesh. He still has the Surcat in the back pocket, and, well, two of those three have already been addressed. So we could see the Bolts try and pick their jungler in this top three slot so he doesn't have to eat a couple more bands his way. But generally, they do like to save that jungle pick after that second phase. And do you think it'd be wise for both of these teams to try and prioritize their mid lanes as well in the top three mid lane, given how many bands we saw specifically towards that mage pool? I, it could serve either of these teams very well, but with the bands that have already rung true, Tiamat and Raijin removed from the board, Soul as well, there's not too much I think that they have to fight over right now. The priorities have kind of already been addressed, so they could save it a little bit more so, and then maybe you get your wish, Taka. We see a, a Zhongkui come through or something along those lines. Well, what do you think of the odds of an Anu looking to resort back towards that Morgan? Because he has shown a lot of preference or preference towards that pick whenever it's available, but on that same note, I definitely feel as though Shinto is someone that can also be pretty aggressive off the Morgan as well. Yeah, I don't, I don't think Ven's going to take the Morgan. Uh, Baba Yaga's <laughs> locked in here, Taco. First up, overall, this is a very consistent pick. I mean, we can talk all day about how this no boots change has probably helped Baba Yaga more so than any other god in the game just because she's allowed to stack early on and utilize that passive, but I think that the Morgan and Morgan LeFay together kind of find themselves in a spot where you're not really allowed to pick them in that top three slot. They're incredibly strong in their own right, but you need to find compositions uh, against and with that are capable of facilitating her play style. So instead, generally, if I do think we're going to see those picks, it's going to be in the second phase. Well, do you expect this Osiris to encounter some struggles now up against the Baba Yaga? I do think that between her blast off and the home sweet home, she can be relatively problematic to try and lock down for a god like the Osiris. Yeah, you're going to need some more dive, some more concentrated dive from the side of the bolt or Leviathans, rather, if they want to deal with this Baba Yaga. Or they could just ignore her and play their own counter engage style, which seems to be the strategy here. Terra already locked in and has a very good matchup into the Baba Yaga. The home sweet home, once you're tossing out those magical fires, that's all dot damage, which means you're going to get that burst heal from the Earthen Fury every time. And it seems as though Zapman looking to really just double down on this dual lane aggression here. Rom, while he might not necessarily be the most prevalent hunter in terms of buff secure, that wave clear is, is definitely nothing to scoff at. I think the Astral Arrows could certainly be pretty impactful here if Awesome Jake isn't careful with that Fafnir early on. And Rom seems to be uh, a favored answer of these SPL teams to the Baba Yaga pick. It's so hard to full dive a Baba Yaga when she's full HP. She's got Warlock Staff all the time. I mean, I'm just going to go ahead and say that she has Warlock Staff before we even see it get built because of how core that item is on her. <laughs> That's fair enough. And then you've got the Hell Shield from Home Sweet Home, the Knock Away. She's got decent ways to proc sustain if she does decide to go for a little bit of lifesteal inside of the build. So what these SPL teams have been doing is taking this ROM, using his ultimate as an engage, saying, all right, if I can hit a couple of shots under the Baba Yaga, she's going to be a little bit lower HP. She'll be a lot less survivable. And if we don't hit our shots, let's disengage. Let's back up. Let's see if we can uh, wait a little bit longer to take this team fight. And that seems to be the answer. How feasible do you think it is, though, for the Leviathans to actually effectively disengage when they look for those type of Astral Barrage commitments into the Baba Yaga? Because when you're dealing with a Fafnir and a Guan Yu Mifflin, I'm seeing a couple of guys that have a really easy time just running straight to the back line. Yeah, there, there's definitely ways for the bolts to chase out, but the disengage from the Leviathans just off of this Terra pick alone is incredibly strong. She can lock down Jungle Pass with a second ability or lock down entire lanes with her third ability for the disengage as well. Earthen Fury as a re-engage tool is incredibly strong. So the Leviathans have gotten themselves some tools to help out with that strategy, but you can see that the bolts have already identified that. They want the ability to chase down. It's not just Fafnir and Guan Yu, but it's also... the the Chernakuda here from, from Barracuda, able to lock them down with that global range. And I also think that the Chernabog introduces a, a rather interesting dynamic here for the rest of this bolt composition, Mifflin, because while we tend to think about these globals as that ultimate dive potential, on that same note, that Chernabog does provide a pretty impactful slow, and that can make it even more problematic for the likes of a Rom, for the likes of an Erlung Shen, who really does not fare too well up against slows, to actually try and, and look for that ultimate punishment on the bolts. Yeah, and Erlong Shen, I think, brings a little bit of ambiguity to this draft, could go into the soul lane, could still be in the jungle for Panatom. Panatom generally does prefer Erlang over this Osiris. So I think that there is a slight bit of ambiguity. We'll see where he decides to put that god, but Morgan Lefay locked in. 
This is a good composition for her as well. Great king protection or protection strategy. You've got Erlang Shen as that front line. Osiris as well. Terra for that back line disengage. And Morgan Le Fay should be able to get off her damage from a decent range inside of this one. Especially up against something like a Daji. I've described Dragonflight as a unreactable CC. Daji's going to teleport in and then be forced to immediately cha cha channel that thousand cuts, the second ability, so he doesn't get knocked away. Or You're not pre-beading it. You're not reacting to it. It just comes out out so fast, the Dragonflight. What do you think about this Daji versus Erlong matchup exclusively, though, Mifflin? Because Daji has been a, a bit of a response pick at times, I feel like, for the Erlong, given that he doesn't have that CC immunity in his ultimate. And do you expect that that might pose some issues here for the Leviathans? Because it seems as though there's a lot of dependence on this Erlong for setup early on. Yeah, it might force this Erlong Chen to go towards beads in that first slot, which is going to really hamper the Leviathan's ability to engage fights early on. But if he doesn't go for that beads, well, Palau's just going to be a death sentence with Baba Yaga damage or follow-up CC from the Fafnir as well. I think that Erlong Shen is one of the most volatile picks we've seen in the SPL. It's feast or famine through and through. If you fall behind on Erlang Shen, well, you're going to put 2,500 damage on the board in a 20-minute game. If you pull ahead, well, you're going to destroy this match and 1v1 literally anyone you come in contact with. The Leviathan's putting it all on the line here. I think Panitham's really going to have to work hand-in-hand -hand there with Rongyu to really find the ultimate success off of that Erlong pick. But also, Mifflin, I, I like the switch up here from the Leviathans in comparison to some of their previous drafts and other sets. I, I think that this introduction towards that early flexibility because the Osiris relatively ambiguous as far as where it was actually headed at the start of this draft. And do you think that that might have caught the bolts a little bit off guard here? Uh, it it could have, for sure. It doesn't really have too many counter matchups. There's not like, okay, it's Osiris solo, we need to get this god. It's Osiris jungle, we need to get this god. Instead, it just does maybe affect the bolts and the bands a little bit. If, if they had realized that this is going to be Osiris in the solo lane, which I believe it will be, they could have tossed some more bands towards Panaton. But instead, they were kind of forced to emphasize bands towards the mid lane because of the ambiguity afforded by Osiris. And that Lord of the Afterlife as well, negating that option for the team sustain that Guan Yu might have otherwise been able to provide, but granted, you have to be incredibly accurate with that ultimate on the Osiris, and I think that there can't really be a, a, a point of hesitation here with this Leviathan's composition. This is kind of an all-or-nothing draft in my eyes. Oh, well, they've got good disengage, though. I mean, you can't, I gotta put some respect on the Terra. You well, know, we might get to put a little bit more than just respect on the Terra here, Mifflin, because we've got game number two with the Atlantis Leviathan's looking to bounce back up against the Olympus Bolts here in studio. Dulcin Gore, take it away. Can the Olympus Bolts do it again? They run over the Atlantis Leviathans in game number one. And now a chance to 2-0 the team that's chasing their heels at the top of the standings. Gormaz, we discussed this a little bit in the green room. That's wrong. You is going to delay out this wave. That, uh, that statistically, what did we say? 67% uh, win yeah. rate here for first pick. So uh, fighting against history are the Olympus Bolts. Uh, trying to make those odds go down as much as it was. I think up to this week it was like 61, and then everyone this week is, for some reason, first pick's just been winning a whole lot this week, so it kind of shimmied things back over in their favor. Look, we came to this screen. I heard a ton of pings. I thought we were going to open up to a team invading somebody here, but it was just uh, the, the small trying to figure out where they were going to go, I guess maybe pre-planning. And, of course, as you had mentioned, the delayed minion wave from Rong Yu, which ultimately shifts things like five feet forward here uh, at the end of the day, just because he had to go get that buff. Wildly huh. important, Gore. I think Honestly, it's going to change the face of the Look lane. at the wall coverage they have now, though. Like, uh, theoretically, <laughs> if you were going to fight at level two, that was a good advantage for them. Well, now their wave is, uh, is pushing back towards uh, Jake and Barracuda anyway. Maybe that's a way of just finding extra pressure where, uh, where Jake wasn't able to... Er, Barra, excuse me, wasn't able to clean up uh, that wave just in time. Lazbra on the Daji this game. Panatom over on the Erlong Shen. And so that's going to be a fun duel to follow along with here, Gore, where, where Erlong, you already get the mindset. We figured it'd be Mannequins uh, as, as the starter item here for Panatom. Uh, and then Lazbra on the Daji. The, the desk mentioned there might be some difficult matchups, particularly uh, Mif, I, I think, highlighted how things could interact there with Morgan Le Fay in the mid lane. Yeah. But, but Daji... You know, not all that standard here, Gore. So I think Lazbra is certainly capable of playing it, but uh, maybe another route where you're fighting against history. Yeah, I think Sir Kett banned against them. That's something I think would have felt more comfortable there for Lazbra and probably would have been able to get the same thing done. But Laz or the Daji specifically up against this Morgan Le Fay, who, who is not incredibly mobile. She does have some self-peel. And look, there's a Terra, there's an Erlong around you. You've got your team to peel for you as well. 
There's a lot of opportunities, I think, for Lazarus to specifically collapse in on Shinto, shut down the mid laner there for the Leviathans. And it's all going to be up to him. And I think a little bit to Haddix a little bit later, too. The, the, the Guan Yu is great at diving into some of those late-game fights. I think they might know that, because they're chasing Lesber down deep in the jungle. Panaton was able to, to take away that, that singular Harpy just back behind the uh, in-between Fire Giant and Blue Buff on the Olympus Bolt side of the map. So a little bit of farm, literally one camp going over towards Panaton. But there is a rotation. Venenu's making his way on in from mid lane. Haddox and Yarkor both half HP here. Panaton has stuck around. This is a three versus two. But enough mobility there where Panaton will just take some damage and he'll leave. That's one of those best of both worlds rotations, right? If you get a kill, great for Vin. If you don't, worst case scenario, you just pressured out the Leviathan so they didn't get to steal the blue buff. And you can still head on back, still farm up this wave. But Shinto's going to rotate in towards this red buff here. Could be an invade, or it could be a fight up against Awesome Jake, who's still level 3, who leaps on away, gets knocked up by Good Jinto. Stuff. But watch out for the rest of the Olympus Bolts. They're closing the gaps in here. It's a level 4 Vinayne, who doesn't have that ultimate. Shinto does have the ultimate on Morgan Le Fay. Awesome Jake and Barracuda, both still level 3. I wondered if we would see, since Awesome Jake is somewhat low, exactly this, a purple buff steal attempt. Wrong, you throws up the walls here, smartly delayed out by the Olympus Bolts and dropped by the Olympus Bolts. And scooped up there by Jake, maybe not exactly where they wanted it to go, but as long as it's not on the belt of Wrong Yu, yep. they're going to be happy with it. It does showcase something, though. It was, what, eight minutes into the game one before we saw first blood here. Granted, we still haven't seen it in three minutes, but there's been a lot more action from these teams. And I the think risk. that comes at the, the merit when you have something like Terra, someone who's great at engaging, especially early on, but also has some self-sustain and, and some sustain for the team, as you're going to be able to bring. You also don't have to fight into the Yamoja if you're the Leviathans here. You're not worried about Jake healing everybody up. In fact, it's easier because Jake can't do it. The most he has is some peel with the axe, or sorry, the hammer as of right now. Eventually the dragon form, but he still has a level to go before that ult's online. And so I like the fact that the Leviathans are being a little more proactive early on. It's not a big lead, but it's still something for them to, to really start to showcase that they can be a little more active and, and shut down the bolts faster. It feels like Shinto Gore for, for the Leviathans has, has felt comfortable in the onset of this game. Has had a, a stable about half level lead over Venenu, remember, rotated in around that red buff with the ultimate. Venenu didn't have the ultimate just yet. Shinto loves his Pythax yeah. piece. We, we saw it on Merlin in game one. Didn't quite work out. Not necessarily build-centric, potentially at least. It was uh, it was a lot of what the Bolts were able to do on their side. Now another example of it here on the Morgan Le Fay, where Venenu, it's a little bit more standard here on, on the Baba Yaga. I think that's more tried and true. Warlock staff first. Tend to see Charon's coin second. It's a little bit more fleshed out. Whereas maybe Morgan Le Fay, uh, still a little theory crafting going on in the build. And honestly, Baba is maybe the only mage right now that would be going with these stacking items so early on. And I see Panatom over here, which makes me want to pivot. But it doesn't have enough so merits bye -bye. to it yet to say whether or not it's actually going to happen. The only other mage I can think of is maybe Kukul Khan, because you might right, want to go for a Thoth very yep. early on. And, and with no boots, it's a lot easier to make that sacrifice and start sacking it immediately. The house is just, just Baba. It feels like so such high so value good. with uh, with the house pass. Is it 27 there, stacks for five minutes It in. stacks you up so quickly where uh, it's almost a no-brainer. You're likely misplaying if you're not uh, stacking up a couple things here on this Baba Yaga. So Venenu. Going the way things we expect here, and that's I think that's important to follow along with here, Gore. We're still learning a lot about this Morgan Le Fay, and at the SPL level, how the the power curve starts to look on this pick, where Bobby Yaga gets a little bit more fleshed out, where where the storyline for so long has been early game is miserable, and it's not miserable, it's not great, but it's not you know the worst thing ever. We've seen Venenu get first blood or, or the first couple of kills, maybe even yeah. for the Olympus Bolts in a few of these games, but we know for sure. That by the time late game rolls around, Venenu's going to absolutely be swinging. Lazbra forced into his ultimate here. Panatom does have beads. Will taunt him instead onto the mid lane. Venenu has his ultimate this time, but Shinto's got the damage. Goodbye, Lazbra. And that is simple for the Leviathans. Wrong you with a big taunt in. Now get first blood to the levees. I mean, that was one small step away from being Panatom who goes down. Shinto really recognizing the situation. It's Panatom who burns his beats. Shinto lets himself get pulled, yep. so he manages wow, to hold on. Now Shinto's in danger. Yeah, Venenu's got to leave, so that's going to be out. just awesome Jake here. In this fight, but Barracuda can close that gap. This is what Chernabog wants to do. Horrific Emblem dropped on down as Shinto will get stunned. Has to use the beats this time, but watch out for Rongyu in the back. He doesn't have the HP to fight. Shinto doesn't have the mana to come back in, and Barracuda returns the favor. I want to say long term, though, you trade support for jungle. In fact, now Wrong Yu's level 6, which is on par with Lazbur, so I think you're feeling pretty good if you're the Leviathans getting that first blood Whoa. bounty in. 
Starting up a Gold Fury this early? The, the Bolts know it, though. The Bolts know this. It's going to have to be quick by the Leviathans. Lasbro's around yeah, the corner here. Gore, I don't know if he has the distance to get on in. Right there, Gold Fury taken down by the Leviathans. Oh, no. It could be a kill on the back end, and there is as well. Awesome Jake is here, though. Could provide some lockdown for the rest of the Bolts to get in. Hammer no good. And the Leviathans get away with the kill and an early Gold Fury. What a hell of a start for the Leviathans. That I was mean, a fast that, Gold Fury. That just changed everything from game number two, one. I, I mean, this is has changed pace in terms of how aggressive they're being, but to read that situation and recognize, hey, wait, they all had to back there. The bolt, there's no way the bolts are still going to be here. We got some of the beads. We, we forced the ults out of Barracuda, and we know that he had to back before going to lane because that's just the way things are. Let's get aggressive onto it. The fact that they had the damage for us may be even more impressive for me. At the early game, you're typically seeing people balance it between maybe two, three members, and it's difficult. You're all going to walk away incredibly low. That's exactly what happened. Zapman uses his ult to stay alive a little bit from Laz, but also get some vision there to help out Panatom. And that skyrockets them to a comfortable lead again, Dave. And at this rate, they're controlling a lot of where the, the bolts are, are really yep. looking to find a lot of their potential. Until that Pyromancer comes up, the Bolts really don't have anything to fight over right now. And remember how Panatom kind of faded away in game number one. We, we referenced how last on the net worth charts, and what a different story we've seen here from Panatom. Helps out with First Blood and helps out with the Gold Fury. It could bail on, on Erlang Shen plus on Zatman. Maybe nets you an early yeah. Gold Fury there. That opens up the door to, uh, to get that one down maybe just a bit quicker. So the Leviathans, they, they find their power window and... and, and I mean, I, I say risky, and there, there's always going to be risk associated with it, but the correct call. And now in back-to-back -back game score, even though a loss in game one, we've seen the Leviathans make quick split decision calls. One on starting up the Fire Giant in game one, and then a quick call where they know they've had the Volts pushed back. We can really quickly do this uh, this Gold Fury. And so the Leviathan's showing us some great decision-making here. Yarkor's going to have to make some decisions, though. As awesome Jake is rotated towards the right. Horrific Emblem used once more, and this time the stun will connect. The transformation on the other end as well could help in closing up that gap. It's Yarkor attempting to get on out, but he won't. As Jake burns him through, but now Panatom, Panatom. he's alone. Panatom has his own. It's going to be a three-man taunt. That slows things down for Rongi, but Barracuda, he's dashed on over from the right, but the damage isn't quite there. Not just yet. Panatom does end up going down, Gore, but there's still a fight to be had. I mean, Shinto's looking to be the next one locked down. They have that tier one tower, though, Dave, and it's so difficult to aggress into. Wow. And that is a two for one trade, Gore, and with everything that the Bolts commit there, the Leviathan's probably feeling okay with that, right? The Bolts get two, but they spend Barracuda's ultimate. He has to come over here. And look at what Zapman's doing, the right thing. He's just stripping away farm on the left side of the map. He's got that wave pushed up on in. So there is a slight down tick in gold and XP towards the Bolts. But, but it's nothing nothing close to a, to a game-changing fight. I'd say it maybe even more unfortunate for them was they were about 20 seconds, maybe 25, too early for the Pyromancer. Otherwise, that's an easy rotation, right? You're like, cool, we just got two kills to go over, yep. kill our Pyromancer, then we back to base and at least have a neutral objective under our belts. It's available now for them, but... It's not going to be quite as easy. And I, I'm curious to watch how this transitions, though, because that showcases, one, that the Bolts are more than capable of fighting back. Yep. But I think it translates even more into this long game conversation, which is to turn your eyes and avert them down to the 40-second timer there on the Horrific Emblem for Jake. Now, not only do I like Horrific Emblem because of, of the slow that it brings, but attack speed reduction is the point of this conversation. Not just from Horrific Emblem, I also wouldn't mind seeing like a Witchblade a little bit later. Let's, let's look at the, the Leviathans. Yarkor. Oh man, Osiris? He loves to auto-attack a whole ton, doesn't he? Panatom? Oh man, he really loves to yep. auto-attack. Zatman? You know he's going to be. Wrong you, as much as Terra autos aren't necessarily devastating in power, they do slow, so that can be devastating, and making sure that Wrong is not able to apply it as often is going to be helpful. And same thing for Shinto, it does apply pretty well in the middle of a Morgan the Fey Chain. So realistically, not only is that horrific really helpful, I wouldn't mind seeing maybe a double down for the Bolt to try and, try and control that, and that is going to be so crucial in a yep. lot of those late game fights, plus the upgraded horrific reduces the damage they're dealing. Yep. I think this is going to be something that could, could really be devastating to the Leviathans in a group up. And it's something that Jake has used a, a few times here, really for the slow, it feels like right now, and locking down and helping locking down one individual target. Haddix is alone here with three members of the Atlantis Leviathans. It looks like Awesome Jake is going to rotate in, do his best to help, but Barracuda has been so active. Active, active with these ultimates. It's another big taunt from Panatom. And that's got Haddock pulled back into the Leviathan tier. But look at Barracuda free casting as the ultimate from Daju will pull two back in. The collapse from the Olympus Bolts is so quick 
They're only able to get one, but now they've got some space around the pyro. And they're going to be able to pick this up. Haddix is low, he's got healing. Well, Zap is low, rotated. he's got healing, but Zap can go for the steal. Zap is up in the sky. Oh, he's got the damage for Lazbra, but the, pa the pyro man shot. still stands. The snipe doesn't end up coming in on the other side of things, but Lazbra has fallen here now. 0-4 on this Dashi. Awesome Jake locked into place before he dashes his way away. And wrong, you steal it on the chase. Shinto's got the range. And Awesome Jake's got the death. Now Zapman being chased down by Vananu here, who's alone with three and double kill for the Morgan Le Fay. Man, that shape was almost enough to turn around and slap Zapman twice. Well, lucky for him, he only gets hit on the outgoing of the oval, not the income. That is a really good engage from the Bolts. Barracuda is doing such phenomenal work with these rotations. When I mean, you had called it out, so Haddock seems completely out of order there. They're, there's no way anyone's going to be able to save him. They collapse in on him, they lock him down, and then you see the, the collapse in from the Bolts with Vera making a huge rotation. Up to the pal out from Lasbra, everything felt great but you highlighted it perfect in the middle of the fight. They only get Panatom with it. They aren't able to find uh, the duo, the double kill that they would have liked. They start putting that pressure onto the, the Pyromancer, and lo and behold, Zatman, has, he's, I don't know if you watched that fight, but he, he was booking it from left lane. The minute Barrel left, he started running over. And it took a little while, but once you get there, the snipes are so crucial around objectives that yep. made things so much easier for him to not only get a kill, but even put pressure onto the objective itself. Well, that's the important thing there, Gore, is that that's really where it feels like that fight flips, where, where Lazbra is no longer in it. I mean, yeah. he was he was low anyway, so Lazbra was really going to have to pick and choose how he re-engaged on that fight anyway. But just getting him off the map, you know, there, there's no threat there where there were a couple low health targets. Think about a couple of the members of the Leviathans that Venenu nearly got a kill on. Lazbra could have made a difference there. So while the initial rotation was better from, from Barracuda just by nature of the ultimate, that man made made good effort by the time he had rotated in and those snipes definitely connected. So now the Atlantis Leviathans find themselves about one and a half thousand gold up on the Olympus Bolts. Doug has shown us the the Golden XP charts a couple times here, Gore, where, where it feels like the Leviathans are driving a lot of this pressure, and they are. But the Olympus Bolts, they've had these skirmishes over on the right-hand side where, where they kind of win initially. And it feels like that's kept them in the game. And now Ultimate flying on through from Penenu and chunking plenty of damage. And wouldn't you guess it, Barracuda rotates in with his Ultimate. But this time wrong, you won't get rooted in place. And so a couple ults spent Gore with no kills. Two ults for one. The Terra ult was dropped. But ultimately, again, and not only, like, yes, you lost that Pyromancer, but the Leviathans just got that Oni Fury. They've got the timer and everything set up for themselves. They've got the aggression on their side. Like you said, they've been dictating the pace of this. And even in moments like that where they're caught retreating and running away, if the bolts aren't able to find a kill, especially when they burn two big ults like that, I mean, Vin and Vera's ults are massive here. It definitely changes the pace of the game in favor of the Leviathans for the next minute. Panatom has looked fantastic this game. I, I could, I'm not sure there's been a single nine turns blessing that, that hasn't connected onto a, at least two members of the Olympus bolts. We, we've seen some three man, so the, this Erlong Shen, the, the Death oh, talked Haddix. about it, and you talked about it a little bit, that Feast or Famine, right now it's feasting. Haddix might be the next meal on the menu. Yarkor wants it to be. It's a cavalry charge. We'll get Haddock's just a bit out of range, but with the Leviathans rotating like that, no real chance. So in moments like that, you have to look at what, what do the Bolts do in response? The Leviathans send everyone minus that man to the right. There wasn't much left for the Bolts to do anywhere else on the map. It goes back to that Oni Fury, right? Oh, no. Hey, we know what you can't get here, and you force the Pal out now out of Lazbra. Vin's under pressure. I mean, this is a good fight for the Leviathans. Panatom did get pulled into the Pal out. Lasbra is able to make his way onto the mid lane. Zapman sends some snipes on Lasbra's way, but no kills on the other end of things. And now the pace really dictated by the Leviathans, where, where it still felt like the Bolts were looking for some skirmishes, and they were able to, to leverage that, that availability of Barracuda in the fights to tilt things in their favor. But now the Leviathans playing with a heftier gold lead than we saw up to this point. And Gore, the, you know, we, we've seen Morgan Le Fay three times, I believe, and it's one, two out of those three games. This is the first one where it really feels like, to me, unless my memory is just not serving me properly, really feels like maybe the biggest threat Morgan Le Fay we've seen. We're, we're going to get yeah. a real look at a 4-0 Morgan Le Fay and, and, and how a game can be played around that pick. I was going to say, we got to see her, what, a couple times yesterday, a few times overall, and I think for the Warriors was really solid, but they were playing a really, really rough off Scarabs who were coming right. in with a sub, a whole ton of changes that were maybe kind of... Well, let's just face it, making things not as evil, even of a playing field right. as it could have been had they played maybe two weeks ago. But Shinto, specifically here, 4-0, and o, like you had highlighted, going for pretty much the exact same build he had last time. He swapped the Charon's coin, and what was the Polynomicon last time around might still go into that one here as he's got the Tier 2 on the book. 
And even still, it, it feels like maybe it's just his go-to build for it. They're using this Morgan Le Fay incredibly helpfully, but realistically, the thing I'm looking at is something the Leviathans, I think, learned from yesterday when they played the Kings, and that is that this Rom can be so oppressive in the middle yep. of a team fight that it's keeping the backline out of this, at least in terms of snipes. But Zap, I mean, he's been so great in terms of, of getting secure damage, kills off of it, but as well as the, these objective secures that he's able to apply. It's difficult for the bolts to close the, the line and the gap to get to that many. Leviathans have just put so much pressure on, on this right-hand side with the Tier 1 tower earlier. We've seen some blue buff pressure. Look, Yarkor is on, on top of the damage charts. Only 3,000 over uh, his teammate Shinto, but close enough to doubling up the damage of anyone on the Olympus bolts as Osiris has just felt so effective here this game. An important topic, though, Gore, when you're looking at the, the draft that the Leviathans have is... As these fights drag out, right, it, it kind of feels like the Olympus Bolts have had that initial engage a couple of times where they get the initial pick and then the Leviathans yeah. on the second fight back in, it felt good. They've got plenty of sustain, the Leviathans do, uh, between the nine turns. Blessing, Wrong, you provide some healing, Zatman will have healing in his build, you know, you know, other sources, of course, for the Leviathans. So then you wonder, where does the, the anti-heal get prioritized for the Olympus Bolts? So you've got a little bit on Lasbro, a little bit on Venenu here, Contagion picked up for Jake. And so maybe we start to see the, those tail, those scales tilt back towards even where the healing may be a little less impactful. I'm wondering, especially now, Cursed Onk available for Haddix makes it a lot easier. Like, guess who's jumping right in the middle of your team every fight? It yep. should be the Guan Yu going in with a massive stun. So you get a huge stun, you get a huge anti-heal field that's 100%, so nobody's going to be able to heal. Then, because it's Guan Yu, you get some Prot Shred on the front line or whoever he happens to stun right there. Should start to shimmy things over towards the bolts, but it's all on that engage. I mean, that's a lot of pressure on Haddix to have a perfect engage with nothing disrupting him in the process yep. and not dying in the process as well. The very difficult to get all the way there. Gets the upgrade as well, so now anybody he hits with that cursed onk that he just bought, or the upgrade that he just bought, could takes more damage. Here. Could be a fight here, Gore, as the Gold Fury started up by the Leviathans. We'll see if the anti heal can do some work. This one is burning quickly. It's awesome. Jake jumps on in, but the Leviathans make no mistake. Jake will transform into the back line, though. Goes Lasbra. He's found Zatman, but, but Lasbra has to use the powwows defensively here. Zatman will use the snipes. Can he outweigh the pullback in? But I'm not sure it matters here because Lasbra's all alone. The Fury has gone down. Lasbra a couple autos away from falling as well, and the Olympus bolts. They show some face score. They should have stayed home. I also love Zatman's heads up awareness there, which is the fact that Rom can shoot through walls. Like Lasbra, like juking through the or around a corner is not always going to save you from Aram. And even though he didn't quite get it, that is a great play from the Leviathans. Once again, it just feels like they're controlling the bolts. And it's that engage. I mean, Jake goes in. He's blown up before he can even get his ults off there, yep. let alone before anything else can happen. Lazbro is just kind of left out on his own. Uh, this is a, a massive wow. period for me to hit a reset button if I'm the bolts. Fire Giant is the reset button for the Leviathans right now. And We've, we've seen how quickly that this team can, can do these objectives, so there, there's not going to be any intrigue around this FG. And so the largest gold lead, the largest advantage of the set maybe even so far, although the bolts started to run away with things there in, uh, in game number one. But a massive lead now for the Atlantis Leviathans, and they've got all the time in the world. Angor, as uh, Mifflin likes to call him, some caches of gold still left on the map. Five towers, or four towers, excuse me, still standing. Whittle some of those down, get the Phoenix, set yourself up for uh, for an end game later on. And that Soul Reaver just now finished. I mean, look, you just got a lot of gold in your pocket. Everybody should be finishing some items here on the Leviathans, but the Soul Reaver specifically was the one I was harking to. I said Polynomicon earlier, misspoke. Soul Reaver, the one that he buys up. Either way, a lot of power that's coming through. And you're looking at Morgan Le Fay. Look, she's, she has so much that's going to be available for her. Just in terms of controlling the team fight, like the damage has been insane, but you can slow people, you can technically yep. fear people as well, as well as or making a decoy, maybe not the biggest idea in that one, but at least the other two feel really, really impactful here, and I'm expecting uh -oh, to see Bear. that really, really change things, up, especially Bear, I can't get caught out here. He's going to use his ultimate, but not going to matter. Barracuda goes down as Panatom closes that gap. And this is not something we often see, Gore, where the Olympus Bolts are just kind of out of sorts right now, but it... If there's a team that's going to put you out of sorts, the Leviathans have felt like that team here as of yeah. late. And they're putting the bolts all sorts of out of sorts. Fun sentence there. Barracuda's 35 <laughs> seconds away from respawning. And Gore, that's such a difficult time to lose your hunter. You've got no Barra for 30 seconds. The Leviathans yeah. can easily take down this Phoenix. 
maybe even push for more if they can find a fight. I mean, I admire where Lazar is right now. He's putting a little bit of pressure on the left here too, which theoretically, if it goes down here, opens up a Phoenix for the Bolts. There's a win condition for them available on the map, which is heads up play, but I also want to throw Lazbra under the bus here because it does feel like, let's face it, he's 0-5. You look at everybody else on the team, that's where a lot of the pressure has been for the Leviathans, and that's opened up a lot of opportunities for him. You can tell, I think you had said earlier, that this wasn't necessarily the go-to pick for Lazbra on the Daji, and you can really kind of see that coming to fruition here. There's a lot of fun little matchups that maybe do go in his favor and maybe open up the door for him. But at 0-5, he just hadn't been able to get it done the way that you would really like. Still, player damage just barely sitting over where Barra is, who's incredibly low as well, and technically over Terra, but that's not something that you really want to, like, tout to somebody. Right. You're not gloating about that one. And so I want to see where they apply this pressure. Now they have to deal with those fire minions over there on right. Left tier two is low, but there's still five towers up for the Leviathans. It's a lot of work to be done for the Bolts, and they still have a minute of fire giant they have to deal with. Here's the, the, the big brain decision-making play by Barra there. He dies on right because he knows that the Leviathans will push for the right Phoenix, which will be easier to defend on the next FG. Ah. <laughs> he's and thinking, he's playing 40 chest, right. everybody else is playing checkers. Right, he said, look, I could have died <laughs> on the left, but instead they get the right Phoenix. Well, it might not matter, Gord, because you've mentioned they're, they're still just under a minute now on this FG. So, maybe would like to see the Leviathans give one push attempt on this left side Phoenix, but what you, what you don't want to do now is Fire Giant is so close to, to dropping off. Yeah. You've built up a it. huge lead, you, you've gotten the Phoenix. What you, what you don't want to do maybe is take that risk, though the opportunity definitely there if you can find a pick or somebody from the bolt overextends. At this point, this tier two is maybe exactly what I'd want to lock down. Yeah. I mean, you had mentioned it earlier, but a lot of gold that goes in your pocket is going to be 4,500 just from the tier twos off the top. I think the tier one and left fell as well, so technically 5,000 gold. It should be a huge swing for the Leviathans. Knocks down one, maybe going for another tower here for Barra. All right. That's a little bit of gold back in their favor, but again, it's opening the Phoenix that's the big deal to me. I don't care about the gold here if I'm the Bolts, although it's helpful. I care about that Phoenix being exposed with the Fire Giant coming up in a minute. That means if we win this next fight, if we win it heavily enough, despite this deficit for the Bolts, you find a way right back into the Titan. Wondered what we would see there between Awesome Jake and Panatom. We don't have to wonder what we're seeing here on the left. So, Barra out of the fight, but Barra can rejoin the fight quickly. He's joined and he's rooted hardcore in place. The Olympus Bolts feel like they've got something here. They've got low health bars. Watch out for Panatom on the back line. They'll, oh, big stun! On a Jake and Haddix, but it's a pullback in Zap. from Lazbra here in the back what? line. Barracuda being Panatom. knocked down by Panatom. The flank works out, and the Erlong Shen gets an early kill. Look how low everyone on the Leviathans are, but it's the Bolts that are the ones turning and running here. I mean, Rong Yu, Zap, and Harcourt, they all at least someone should have died there, but they've managed to hold it out as long as they can. And it might force a back FG's for them to reset. To come up. FG's coming up. And guess what? There's no Barra for 40 seconds. If they maintain this fight long enough. I guess it depends on the timer on his ult as well. Like, there might be a window for Bear to go up, come down, land in there, but it looks like he's going to respawn well before the ult is truly available for him. Meanwhile, yeah, Zap has no relics. Beads are down for Shinto. Both relics down there for Say that again? as well. Zap has no relics? Zap has no relics. He used them? Just he kidding. <laughs> he's 1 on 6. He's been using them a hefty amount yeah, here. Enough. The bolts have been putting a lot of pressure on him. And you know what? All for naught. He's 1 0 oh, 6. It doesn't matter how often you get back there. He is perfectly yeah, I'm, fine taking I'm that I'm memeing, I'm memeing a man who hasn't died yet this game <laughs> and is, is slamming uh, the Olympus Bolts right now. Look, the, this ROM has been, been an answer a couple of times where in different sets we've seen hunters ju just struggle so much with being dove. And then the immediate pivot by that team is to pick up the ROM. And, yeah. and that's an example that we're seeing here from Zapman where Heimdall had a bit of a tough game, number one, pivot over to the ROM. Looked more consistent here. 1-0-6 oh, for Zapman. Barracuda is back up. Doesn't have the ultimate. But this will be an even fight around the FG. He's on the left side of the map, so he's banking on that ultimate coming up before any fight really breaks out. Three you had highlighted it earlier, but the fire minions dealt with most of the part over there on uh -oh. right lane as well. Awesome Jake. But Jake, no, he's, he's going to be fine for at least a little bit. 20 minions going down mid, though. This Whoa, is a this big fight minions. Oh, my God. The Leviathan. There wasn't a fight to be had. They just they, they do it so quickly, and the Olympus Bolts just didn't have an answer for it, or maybe they didn't want to have an answer for it. They show some face, but with the, the speed the Leviathans were able to do that FG, I mean, I don't know if there's ever a chance for the Olympus Bolts to push things on back. So Barracuda does have his ult, but instead he'll head on back to base here. The right side Phoenix is going to get Siege, but it's so low. 
You gotta feel like just a little bit of damage from the Leviathans will knock it on down. But this time there's no towers to deal with for the Leviathans. They can walk on in and immediately start looking to these Phoenixes. The rotation from the Bolts, I, I want to watch how well they can match this and how well they're going to be able to utilize their defensive nature, like the structures around the base. I That's like the hammer. way that Jake and Haddix can handle this, although both of them haven't necessarily had a lot of clean, open, obvious plays for themselves just yet. It's been hardcore, it's been wrong Hugh setting up a lot of things. Honestly, Panatom has been nuts. He's 5-2, and two. that should already say something, but those taunts uh, you had highlighted earlier, Feel like they're hitting two to three people every single time. Oh, Haddix rooted in place. Lazbra doing his best. Flank and pressure here. Lazbra's gonna have to be let back into the gate. Panatom takes some damage. Can Zapman hit the snipes? Up in the air he goes. A little bit of damage before he crashes back down to Earth. So maybe a small win here for the Olympus Bolts. It's a taunt in onto Awesome Jake who will transform as the mid lane Phoenix ends up going down. Yarkor splitting up so much. And Awesome Jake takes way more damage than he bargained for. The Olympus Bolts have to drop back into the fountain, but they're going to have four members of their team on the defense. They're just going to try to hold on to this one, Dave. And they've got a little bit in their favor, specifically a Titan, but that's about it. With Jake gone, you're really starting to feel flustered. No ults available for the Leviathans. Maybe slows things down, but they just got all their relics back. Like, I honestly want them to stay and fight a little bit longer. Yep. Granted, Only blink. you wow. do have to still deal with the house on the side. The pal out available there for Lazbra. Still some good engage for the Bolts. Three ultimates for the Olympus Bolts, and that, that's what they need to, to close this gap. The first one gets used, and it's Lathbrew. Immediately goes back down to Earth. Second one used, that's Haddix, who has to go back beneath his Phoenix. The Leviathans have weathered the storm, and they've done better. As Shinto will get the kill onto the Guan Yu. Awesome Jake, five seconds back from respawning. Low health bars somewhat on the Leviathans. This is where that healing is going to be important. Yeah, Terra Heal, look, it's, it's going to be able to get you back up a little bit, but it's not enough. And now you're not only in right, but in mid, those minions are coming in. I've had to increase that Winions counter too many times. I don't think the bolts, I mean, they're so close in proximity, they're going to be able to clear it, but I don't know that they have a choice. Lazarus not even going over there. The minions have respawned on right, but th that gap is closing. The Olympus Wait. bolts are going to have to deal with like four fire minion waves. You've got to fight now, and that's what Awesome Jake wants to do. But where did he go? Shinto gets his seventh of the game. Up in the air goes Zatman looking for the snipes on the Van The Aegis saves his life, but a double kill from Shinto. As the fadeaway shot from the Morgan Le Fay gets it done, the Atlantis Leviathans run over the Olympus Bolts, and we're headed on to a game three. Come on, Minions, make them do it again. Oh, I saw an auto okay. from Jabs in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, the Minions still did a lot of the work there. Look, that one was just tried and true control from the Leviathans. Like, I I'm trying yep. to go back to and remember a period where it felt like the Bolts were in control. And it was that maybe that gank on right lane. There was game like one. one, yeah, like game <laughs> one, right? There was maybe a little bit of a period where they had some some aggression that felt like they yep. were really, really fighting on an even playing field. But pretty much every neutral objective, if not every neutral objective, ends up going to the Leviathans. All of the fire giants. I think there was a single pyromancer the bolts pulled back. But just a lot of those fights just fell right through their hands. And that, just that er there was the early gold fury call where, where things really started yeah. to, to shift. That was early. That's seven right? minutes. It was an Erlang Shun and a Ram, both with Ike Vale. And they, they, they get it cleanly and then a kill on the back end. And the Atlantis Leviathans never looked back here in game two. This is the matchup we figured we would see. We got another game three between top two teams here in the SBL. You don't want to miss it. Stick around.
Welcome back, Smite fans, to the Smite Pro League, powered by Alienware. And now this is the in-studio set that I think we've all been waiting for. An absolute treat between the Olympus Bolts versus the Atlantis Leviathans. But of course, none of this action would be possible without our friends over at Alienware. A huge shout-out to them for sponsoring the Smite Pro League this year. And not only that, but you too can game like the pros with these Alienware 240Hz monitors and more by heading on over to SmiteGame.com slash Alienware. Make sure to plug code SmiteAW for a nice little discount for yourself and that's not all you can also join the alienware global community by heading on over to alienwarearena.com and on top of that alienware also does giveaways from time to time amongst other things so make sure to join them on socials by heading on over to instagram and twitter and using at alienware to check out everything that they've got going on all over the social platforms everywhere and again thank you so much to alienware for making sure that we can have these in studio sets be played at the top potential possible mifflin the Atlantis Leviathans managed to stretch this one out to the full three-game series, and I think a large credit of that was just due to the impact that Shinto was having with that Morgan Le Fay. Uh, every conversation we got to start about that match has to start with Shinto, right? He was putting out so much damage from a range. He was finding great self-peel. I got an argument, ac actually, with Aggro saying <laughs> that, uh, you know, Dragonflight might just be a little bit... Uh, I get in arguments with Aggro all the time. Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, mages are in a fine spot. They got, they got <laughs> Vamp Shroud, and, and Baba Yaga and, and Burst of all sorts, but for, for real though, Mifflin, uh, like you were just elaborating, um, I, I do definitely think that this Morgan Le Fay has certainly started to work her way up into the pro level discussion. Yeah, I mean, just look at the damage output, and the, the self peel is actually pretty crazy. We, we thought that maybe one of the greatest weaknesses of Morgan Le Fay, and it is one of her weaknesses, is the fact that she doesn't have great survivability, is largely immobile, but does get a little bit of additional movement speed, has unreactable knockup CC. It's the only unreactable knockup inside the game. You have to pre beads that one because if you're a little bit late, well, then you're golden in the air, and that doesn't help anybody. Shinto on this Morgan Le Fay really just took one of the best initiating factors away from the Olympus Bolts entirely. Awesome Jake never really had had an opportunity every single time he was looking for that draconic transformation he was immediately met with a Morgan Le Fay knockup or an Erlong Shen knockup he just never really had a chance to thrive and look for any of that setup that we're so familiar with him seeing or with seeing him do for the bolts and I think that that definitely created some struggles for the back line more specifically Barracuda as well I, I think that the idea initially worked out with the Trinobog on the globals but, but how do you think it fared as the match developed yeah, it, it went just fine if we want to talk about what the bolts need to adjust it's got to be a conversation that revolves around Lazbra, doesn't it? 0-5 on the Daji, not very impressive in the damage charts either, topping out at around 8,400. He was not allowed to play that game. We had thought maybe it would be him dictating the pace of this one with that powwow, especially considering Erlang Shen doesn't have any CC immunity inside the kit, but Panaton was allowed to have a field day. I mean, we said it earlier, feast or famine on Erlang Shen. Mans was feasting. Uh, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And I think something that both of us might have overlooked just a little bit with that Daji pick, while she was originally considered a, a pretty steep counter matchup before that midseason patch went through, now with the removal of boots, I think making it a lot more feasible for Erlang Shen to just prioritize that Magi's in that second item slot beneath them just made it practically impossible for Lazbro to really have any sort of strong avenues of approach. And if Jake's having to burn that Fafnir hammer every Every single time just to pull the cooldown on that mad guy's cloak just posed too many issues I, I think with the bolts not really having a consistent enough crowd control chain to actually do anything about beneath them here but with picks and bands now for this final game Mifflin we've got the bolts back in that first pick slot and it seems as though whoever gets first pick here comes out on top Seems like it, but now both teams have had a, a little bit of experience inside of this set, trying to figure out what each other are prioritizing, where they're trying to go inside of those first three picks. 
we can see that the Bolts had a pretty good stride inside of the first one. I'm sure the Leviathans have made their adjustments. I got to pass by Oxy on the way in here, and uh, that notebook is not just for show. My man was <laughs> scribbling mightily. And uh, I'm sure he's got plenty of notes to share with his boys here. Already Bolts removing Raijin from the table. Leviathans remove Soul. And this is very reminiscent of what we saw in Game 1. A lot of priority already towards these mid laners. For sure. Venenu and Shinto really having to dive deep into their god pools for this set so far, Mifflin. But also, something I wanted to talk to you about, this Erlong Shen. We've seen Lasbra rock the Erlong Shen in the past couple of weeks. We've seen Benitham rock the same thing. And even here today, obviously, with that Game 2 victory off the back of the Erlong. Do you expect Erlong to become a bit of a priority pick here for the Bolts? It could be, but so far with no other junglers being banned out, I'd say that Lazarus' best pick is likely his Gilgamesh and still available. Leviathan's going to have to make a decision whether or not they want to address that here. It's not so much that I think that they need to prioritize the jungle, sure. Uh, a lot of the Bolt success is rooted when Lazarus is doing well, but he's got a couple of gods that he's really good at. I mean, the Gilgamesh, the Surkat, the Erlong Shen, the Osiris, and, well, every single one of them still available. I'd be surprised if the Bolts don't go towards the Gilga here. Leviathans, I think, making the Bolts have to make a tough decision wow. here, but it's actually going to be the Osiris over everything you just mentioned here, Mifflin. Why do you think that is? Versatility inside of the pick, you can take it into the soul lane, you could send it into the jungle, so it's going to keep the Leviathans guessing, and it's uh, not too easy to counter out. There's not many great matchups into Osiris. There's not a god in the game where you're like, oh, they've got Osiris, let me lock X in to counter him out. It's not like a Jean Kui where Nemesis is really good or, or something along those lines. Instead, it, it's just a blanket safe pick, and you're not showing too much inside of your comp. Any concerns here for Barracuda, though, now that Zetman has locked in that Artemis? Have to remember, she was banned away in game number two. So now that she is available one more time, Leviathans don't waste any time with taking Artemis as a selection. And with Odin having already been banned out, do you think that that's maybe the Bolt's own strategy mildly working against them? It, it could be, man. Artemis is so strong right now with the bow build. Silver Branch gives her so much power with the Vengeful Assault. She's got great survivability because she is slow immune inside that second ability. So Osiris can have a pretty hard time locking her down. And We've seen that the Caledonian Boar, although is killable, has not been killed so far inside of the set. It drops and it stuns out whoever is nearby. Already the Leviathans have got a very strong core of CC and they've still got plenty of ways to go to even expand on that further. Gilgamesh likely going to be going in the jungle. Artemis, the ADC, means that there's plenty of CC to come already. I think the Leviathans got themselves a great top two. And would you expect Awesome Jake to maybe go back to the Fafnir pit because even though it didn't work out for the Bolts in game number two, he was heavily focused out, I think, with a lot of really strong counter initiation from the Leviathans, but can you really afford to risk the Leviathans having the opportunity to take Fafnir for themselves? Yeah, I, I think the Bolts are likely going to take Fafnir, and it's not necessarily because Jake really wants to play it or, or that it fits their composition. It's more so to strip it away from the Leviathans, but eat my words immediately, the Frost Giant <laughs> Locked in, and this is one of the 408 specials. A little bit earlier on in the year, he was running this god just about every single game, and up against Artemis, pretty strong. Sure, she's slow immune, so Glacial Strike not going to be as good. Shards of Ice not going to be as good, but she can't jump. She's stuck there once he drops a wall, and that wall is seven seconds. Just a, just a classic caster's curse uh, opportunity It'd for be like both that. of us there. Hey, it, it happens to the best of us, Myth. That's, that's all it I can really say. It happens to the say. best of us. Yes. Yes. I like, I, like, I like where this is going, but more importantly, Bolts with that Morgan Le Fay, Shinto not going to have his prime time with that Morgan in game number three here, but the Fafnir does in fact rain through for the Leviathans, and Myth, we already kind of talked about the fact that Artemis has a lot of short potential as is. We know that Fafnir is going to add to it, but I do like the idea from the Bolts, because even with Odin being banned away, having some cut off opportunity to try and, and separate these team fights is going to be incredibly impactful, I think, for this Amir. Yeah, I think this Amir is a good selection. So far, only really has a great matchup into this Artemis. Everyone else should be able to just jump over the wall or immune it in some way or the other. But Fafnir, not just good for making Artemis stronger. Well, Gilgamesh is an auto-attack god as well. So that Coerce, just going to make this objective burn, this god burn as well, incredibly strong. And the Leviathans, 
could go a little bit more auto attack inside of this one. There, there are plenty of gods still available. Maybe even see something like a, a Mercury out, out of the jungle if we want to flex this Gilgamesh into the soul lane. So the Leviathans have that ambiguity, but not many people are taking Gilgamesh anywhere besides the jungle. Very true, but taking a step back for a moment away from the team compositions themselves and, and more so locking in on the rosters, uh, from the player perspective, Mifflin, who do you think might be a, a little bit favored here heading into game number three? Do you feel as though it's better to just have things all tied up and just know, all right, best of one, that's going to be the focus? Or do you think that the Leviathans might have gotten a little bit of that momentum edge built for themselves? Well, I've always been one to say that Smite is a momentum-based game. It's how you're feeling. Play, feel good, play good. And certainly the Leviathans coming off of that win are feeling pretty good about themselves. But... The Bolts are no stranger to Game 3 situations. I want to say they've had at least uh, the most Game 3s so far here in Season 8. I, I could be wrong. Gormizer wanted to, to speak to that, but it's not about being right all the time. It's about feeling right. And I do feel right about this call. I, uh, the Bolts already removing a little bit more mid lane presence here in that second phase of bans. Hell and Hibois taken off the table, and the Leviathans saying that it's likely not going to be this Osiris in the jungle. Sir Ket banned in the second phase. And that Discordia coming through as well for Shinto there in the mid lane. Now, Mifflin, when it comes to Amir Osiris, that's definitely a lot of melee up in your face presence. Do you expect that this Discordia is intended to try and control that frontline aspect from the bolts? Or do you think that Shinto's prioritizing this for other means? It's going to help out a lot in the early game. That Discordia passive is likely going to work its way onto this Gilgamesh for the majority of this match. And Gilgamesh does enough damage on his own. And she's got great counter engage potential. The strife is going to be so hard to work through for the Bolts, who generally, when they're engaging a fight, they're not engaging it by jumping in at you or even just like leaping in. Instead, it's walking forward. Osiris, Ymir, Kakulin, all very immobile. Kakulin does have the Salmon Leap, but it's not the longest range jump in the game. So Strife is going to act as a deterrent tool for the Bolts. It's going to be hard for them to try and step up into that. And once they do work their way in, they got to fight into an Artemis, who's going to dig in her heels with the Caledonian Boar, Gilgamesh, who can separate this engagement with the Winds of Shamash. I really do like this Leviathan's draft. If there's one thing that's always been true about the Bolts, though, Mifflin, is that they are not scared of just trying to fight fire with fire. And right now, looking at two incredibly aggressive compositions so far for both of these teams. In terms of counter initiation, though, who would you probably provide the edge to? Counter initiation, probably going to be the Leviathans. They've just got great ways to control space inside of jungle fights. Already highlighted the Strife, the Caledonian Boar, the Winds of Shamash, but initiation proper, gotta give the edge to the Bolts. The Ymir is going to be so great at locking down these jungle lanes. That said, though, if the Bolts aren't winning out on that initial engagement, if the Leviathans are able to counter punch their way in, start to work their way into the back line, Morgan, Lefay, and Rom are going to be left high and dry. This isn't the greatest peel composition that the Bolts have ever had. And when once Rom's in the air, that's essentially all of his safety gone. And once Dragon flights down, well, Morgan LeFay is likely going to follow. Well, I'm glad you brought up the peel aspect here because I was actually going to ask you, for the Leviathans, we saw how well they were able to control Awesome Jake on that Fafnir last game with the Morgan LeFay alone. Do you expect that that's going to be Venenu's responsibility to now try and give Throngyu and the whole of the Leviathans a taste of their own medicine here? If it is his job, it's a, it's a steep job to have, right? <laughs> I mean, this is a, a lot of dive coming through from the Leviathans, and that knockup isn't as good up against this Leviathans draft as it was last game. King Arthur is knockup immune once he's Beyblading. Gilgamesh, sure, you can knock him away with the Hero's Leap as well as the Winds of Shamash. Could lock him down pretty easily as well. I think Morgan Le Fay is going to need a lot of help to survive inside of these fights. And do you expect that, that Discordia Golden Apple could maybe encounter some difficulties against the likes of the Amir? Because again, these walls last for an incredibly long period of time, especially when you get that ability fully channeled with all five points. So you have to imagine that Awesome Jake is just going to be looking to try and harass this Artemis and Disco as much as possible. I think that the, Dis the Discordia in the late game team fight isn't really going to be too worried about who she's hitting. If she's making every Golden Apple land onto Osiris, sure, maybe not a priority target, but... The back line of the Bolts is so exposed, so squishy, so easy to lock down for the front line of the Leviathans that they don't necessarily need Discordia to help out, to get in towards this ROM. It's instead surviving on her own, affording her team that passive, and putting out her damage from a range. So it could spell an issue in, inside of these team fights, but I don't think it's going to come up really. 
think it's worth mentioning as well, Lasbra with this Osiris pick. Every single time that we've seen him operate on the Osiris, we've noticed teams have had a lot of struggle in terms of actually just trying to bring him down. Even when he's been in isolated scenarios, do you expect the Leviathans are going to be a little susceptible here to that kind of Benny Hill theme music that we've been seeing happening time and time again whenever Lasbra's on the Osiris? Well, Lasbra likes to go for a little bit more damage than the last Osiris jungle we saw. That was Cherio for the Scarabs who went just a solo build straight up mystical mail talisman of energy pestilence things along those lines i think it's going to be a stone cutting sword build he's going to go for some auto attack damage he wants to get involved early on i am likely expecting him to go for the mannequin scepter as well so it's whether or not lazarus gonna be able to set that pace that's where it's going to really start to see some differentiation between these two teams the separation begins in the jungle both junglers playing very aggressive gods I think it's just about who hits the ground running. And how much of that in-game map tone presence do you think can be attributed to the fact that these players are actually here in the studios playing these sets live on LAN? Well, I mean, Lanimals, uh, you, got, you got to say it about all these guys. The Bolts have been playing on LAN for a very long time. Barracuda and Zatman, both some of the most storied players inside of the SPL. I think maybe the Leviathans coming in with a, a little bit of less experience out on LAN than the majority of the Bolts are, but... It's hard to say. Both of these guys seem locked in. I've had the opportunity to speak with both teams between these games. And they both seem like they're very confident in their ability to win this one. So I don't think it's weighing on their minds too much. Yeah, that's definitely something worth talking about for the Leviathans because you do have to remember that aside from the recent role swaps, this team may be not as seasoned in terms of these actual in-studios performances, but seems as though they've adapted quite nicely. And honestly, judging by the way that these player cams have looked at the end of each game, whether it's a win or loss, all these guys just seem so focused in. Yeah, and worth noting, I'm pretty sure this is awesome. Jake's second LAN ever. First one was up against the Scarabs yes. uh, last week, now up against the Leviathans. So it is a slight tonal shift for him, but there's good veteranship on this squad to make sure that he isn't feeling too much pressure here. Uh, through and through, both teams have great compositions, Taco. Both of them have great win conditions. The Bolts likely going to be looking for that early game presence out of the long lane, utilizing the pressure of Rom and Ymir, and the Leviathans waiting for that late game phase where they can start to really utilize that dive. So if you're a Bolts fan, you're hoping they hit the ground running quickly. If you're a Leviathans fan and they kind of spin their wheels for the first 15 or 20 minutes, well, that's their win condition too. So keep your eyes on this one. I'm expecting the Bolts to come out running. Be honest, though. How, how sad would you be if you had to play against a, a Gilgamesh, Artemis, Fafnir composition? I'd be pretty sad. You'd be uh, pretty sad. Yeah, that's why, that's why <laughs> I'm casting. Especially if you're Rom. Yeah, I, that's, you're yeah Rom. I, I, I foresaw this as a, maybe something that could happen in my own competitive career, so uh, I dipped out immediately. I said, yeah, <laughs> I'm good. Let me go hop on the caster desk. It's uh, way easier to do this than it run. is to perform. No, no, no. I definitely understand where you're coming from, Mifflin. But also important to note that this Rom versus Artemis matchup, while we haven't really seen a whole lot of 1v1 opportunities for Zatman and Barracuda, have to remember that Artemis probably provided a slight edge in this matchup because every single time Rom looks for that Astral Barrage, he might get met with a trap at the bottom, and that could be enough initiation to kind of topple the fight that the Leviathans are really just looking to focus out Barracuda here. And depending on how long Rom sits in the air, you can actually double trap off a of Rom ult, drop one immediately once he goes up, comes down, lands into it, drop another one while he's already stuck inside of it as well. There's a lot of CC potential from this Leviathan's draft, and it doesn't just have to be the Artemis. If Fafnir's there, well, you're probably getting a hammer too. Well, we're finally going to get an opportunity to see who's going to be able to bring it home between these two Titan teams as Dulcin and Gore will take it over for game number three. One more time, in we go as the Olympus Bolts and the Atlantis Leviathans duel it out to find ourselves a winner here in the top two of the SPO. My name is Dolson. Gormaz are still with me. Doug still with us, of course. And Gore, this is a big one. This is the set I think we all wanted here today as, uh, as the, the studio play continues for, uh, for the teams who are able to come on in. And some pivots happening here. Barracuda, look, I, I think my eyes immediately go there because Barra had an effective game on the Chernabog as far as getting into those fights. He used the ultimate basically on a cooldown when yeah. the fights were happening. But then once he got there, it, it felt like difficult to stay alive. Now it's the pivot that we talked about in game two, where if you have that type of game, give yourself something a little bit more safe, 
and Rom is the answer. And I like this. For some reason, like, it just feels natural to look down and see Barracuda's name next to the ROM icon. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. Maybe that's something other people no, would calming, recognize right? as well. Yeah, it feels right in the world. How about Zapman and Artemis? <laughs> uh, Zapman next to ROM also felt way better than, than Zapman and Artemis. But sure. this is definitely feeling a lot better in this current right the now Zartemis, season baby. 8 as opposed to maybe all-time SPL. And it's making things a lot more interesting. Look, Rom Ymir, that's yep. going to be a very fun lane. But just as deadly, if not maybe actually more deadly, is this Fafnir Artemis. The duo lane has a lot of potential. I mean, we've seen both times, I think, the Le Leviathans pushing up a little bit on the bolts and causing them a little bit of worry, a little bit of uncomfort. I would not be surprised if we have a first blood in this lane. I'm just trying to figure out who it's going to be, whether it's the stun from the Fafnir right. or a good wall stun combo from Jake. Having that Sunder might tip things over towards Wrong Yu, though it's it's been more how that Sunder can play a role in team fights later on in the game. Look at the slow applied to Panatom here. That's going to force the leap away from the Gilgamesh. And so often we've seen the, these junglers rotate into the mid lane to help out at level two. And a lot of poking going back and forth, and usually both junglers end up at half HP, but this time it's Panatom who takes most of the damage. Damage enough sustain, though, that'll keep him in that fight. And Osiris in the jungle here for Lazarus, so no surprise in the build there. Panatom opting for uh, for mannequins on the start here as well. I think this will be a battle, because up to this point, it's felt like Panatom fell by the wayside in game one. Yep. Lazarus Daji in game two, forgettable. And now we move in here into a, a pivotal game three for both of these teams trying to find a win. And both junglers got playmaking uh, potential on their side. I'm excited to see the fact that Lazaro went back to what worked out so well in game one, which was this Osiris. But curious to see them pick it over the Gilgamesh. I think the Gilgamesh has been treating, he's been treating a lot of teams really nicely as of late. And so I expect to see Panatom be a lot more proactive here maybe than what we'll get to see out of Lasber in the early on portions of this game. And already, I mean, it's it's very small, but an invade Ooh, nonetheless. Quick turnaround there for Panatom to get the stun onto Lasber, and that actually might tilt the scales a little bit in this duel. Haddix has to deal with the wave that's pushing underneath his tower here, so that'll give the Arcorn and Panatom a little bit more space to push on in. We're brawling over this Harpy. I was, I was expecting a fight to break out, but uh, but not to be. So Yarkor winning this matchup, this is something the Death described as a bit of a 50-50 play. And right now, Yarkor feeling a little bit more comfortable, and that puts this blue buff at serious risk. Caddox is going to de-transform here, just over 200 HP. Blue buff gets dropped down. Now Panatom potentially a little cut out, because watch out from the mid lane. The Morgan Le Fay rotating in, but instead of Caddox with a sneaky bit of damage over the wall. And I don't even know if the rotation from Venenu was necessary there. Lasbra did enough to get Panatom low. I think if they had a slight bit more of CC there to lock down Harkor, then, then all of a sudden Venenu's rotation turns into a second kill, right? It's and Haddox only got the blue. He got there a little bit later. So yeah, they confirm the blue. Haddox gets the first blood and the wow. kill for that one as well. So you're feeling pretty happy, I think, with that engagement from the Bolts. And it showcases that Vin is more than willing to leave this lane and rotate out. I think that's something that we saw out of Shinto. Actually, we've kind of seen both mid laners doing a little more willy-nilly. This game is just leaving the lane for funsies. The Baba Yaga, though, was massive with a lot of those rotations in game number one for Vin. And so I'm excited and happy to see him back into that same mindset because I think it's giving the Bolts a little more traction under their feet. Especially since they need it, because the Leviathans just get better with time. I, I love this uh, this stacking. Not only we talked a little bit about the lane phase for uh, for Fafnir plus Artemis, but Chorus has got to just feel so good with uh, with the build path that the Artemis tends to go. You get your self stim, especially if you get Silver Branch there at some point. Gore, I mean, you are just swinging for the fences. Oh, yeah. It's got to feel like at some point. And, and like Fafnir, three items, that man's right. toasted. Right, and, and that was a threat, wasn't it, in game two, where the Leviathans were going for some of those early objectives quickly with just a couple members of their team. As Haddox could dive the tower here to the Arcor dashes away from the root at least. But there was damage on the back end. And so now I will return to that thought about the dual lane, but but really I think this is more important while it's on our screen. It's that Yarkor, remember, had all this pressure early on in this lane, and that, that solo or that, that that first blood kill for Haddox has kind of flipped things around and now that lead is gone. I mean it's a massive Honestly, a massive thing to pull back if you're in the Leviathans more than anything. In terms of their pressure, Vin is in an interesting spot. Bear is looking to rotate over as well. I'm wondering if they're going to commit to a fight here Ooh. and go for a, a Scorpion. Shinto dashes away here. One slow connects, and then a Strife, I think, well placed. If Lasbra continued on, it would have been a root right underneath the Tier 1 tower. Barracuda and Awesome Jake, level 6 for Barra. Zapman at level 5, so both ultimates are there. But in a space like this early on, everyone does have their beats for the bolts. 
but a big boar can lock down a lot of these bolts. So Zatman's going to have to put himself in an interesting spot here. Panatom drop kicks the purple buff on away, but Awesome Jake is able to confirm it. And it's just the threat of the bolts here that give the purple buff on over. If anything, oh. I want to say Panatom kicked the purple buff into the bolts there. To take <laughs> it, I want to leave. <laughs> get it out out of here. I don't want it anymore. Nobody does. Either way, it does get them out alive, at least in the sense that they didn't lose anybody in the process. But the experience going the way of the bolts, and they're able to continue stripping away. At least this side, uh -oh. this side they're a part of the jungle. Now Lazarus in trouble. Because Lazarus, uh, just a minute ago, had to use his ultimate to leap away from the apple and nearly has to pay for it. That's why Shinto doesn't have his ultimate here. Tried to catch out Lazarus over by that red buff a moment ago with the apple. Lazarus leapt on over it with the Lord of the Afterlife. Lucky for Lazbra, just shy of enough damage from Shinto and Rongyu there to end up getting the kill. So the Nainu goes back, and remember we saw Shinto build uh, the Pythax piece uh, on Morgan Le Fay in game number two. Looks like two more is still going to be the start here for Ven. Likes it on the Morgan in game one, and now on the Morgan in, uh, in game three. <laughs> I think uh, a good pickup for him. Again, a lot of good damage. That's going to be able to come through. And if, if, look, if you can get half of what Shinto was able to do last game, I think you're in a great position, right? I mean, Shinto, that was, was 8 0 1, something like that at the very Definitely. end of it. It was massive in terms of the pressure it was able to apply. But you had highlighted the Pythax piece being skipped over here on the opposite side from Shinto. Instead of going for the Pythags and the Typhons and the what have you afterward, your your, your Soul Reavers and your right. Charon Squad. He goes for the Charon Squad immediately. Which admittedly, both of these teams and both of these players, when they picked it up a little later in their build, still managed to stack it because of how hard their team was winning. But I'm curious, or at least uh, excited to watch where Shinto is going to go with the rest of this build. If any of those other items trickle their way in here, or if it's going to be a little more standard, potentially even... Maybe, no, not even a Divine Ruin, just strictly power portioned here right. for this Discordia to hit harder. Divine Ruin could help. There is some early, early anti-heal yeah. anyway for Panatom as the uh, the Brawler's Beat Stick is there. And this is something we started to see a little bit more on the King Arthur Gore, the, the early sovereignty. I figured in the first couple of games where we saw it, it was just there's this overwhelming physical damage threat, and that's that's tended to be when you pick up a sovereignty. But it's a, a standard draft, all things considered, as far as magical, physical split for the Olympus Bolts. That, that's just becoming an item. It feels like King Arthur and, and some soul laners want to prioritize a little bit more. Hammer does connect. Venenu has beads, doesn't use them, doesn't use them on the Stripe either. Takes half of his HP and damage. Still holds on to his active, though. Maybe that's all the Leviathans were looking for, was a little bit of poke. I really, I really want to watch the Leviathans. Look, seven minutes, eight minutes in, there's Gold Fury. Last time around, that was where they wanted to go. I don't think they're going for it this time around. I'm wondering if the bolts are going to do something similar or not and try to get that early pressure. That really was, uh, Do they I have think the same threat? I mean, Tikkavale, I guess the Coerce maybe makes the difference. If you send yeah. Rongyu, Zatman, and Panatom over. Because last time it was just Panatom and Zatman. Zatman. And that was what was ridiculous to me. The, and they the fact that they it. were both able to do that. Right. Yeah, you're definitely going to need three people on the Leviathan specifically to do that. Might be able to get away with just Jake and Vera on the Good. side of the bolts, but right now it's Panatom who's in trouble. Might not have Jake, though. If he gets taken down here, Lasbro is in. That's oh, what a great wall from Awesome Jake, but Shinto can dash right on through. There's got to be a kill for the Leviathans, and it is. But look at Rongyu, the target priority leaps over the wall, gets the stun onto Lasbro. Not enough to get the kill. But I think great swapping there for the Leviathans to notch their first of the game, and Awesome Jake takes a tumble. And look, this is 75% games oh, no, on land winner for Jake. I can't even meme Lazarus in trouble. And Lord of the Afterlife is going to have to get used to save him here, and that's a good call from the Leviathans. You know, Lazbra just healthy enough to stick around, and the Leviathans will call him on it. That's two pairs of beads now. Jake's beads down for about two minutes, a little over two minutes, just under two and a half there for Lazbra. So a lot of openings and opportunities. Panatom, Shinto, Rong Yu, the steady available CC that's there for the Leviathans is going to be very problematic. I mean, it, Strife is the least worrisome of all of those, and still a good Strife so good, yeah. will absolutely decimate you. I'll throw it out there as well, watching Shinto and how it's going to flourish. Third on the player damage charts right now, Discordia is the god that had the highest player damage ever done in the game. I think it was like 81,000 damage wow. done uh, done years and years ago. And so just watch Shinto because he it's going to hurt. That's how this game's going to roll. Has his own passive right now. I think Shinto is really going to be able to apply the hurt to the bolts and could, as much like last game, be a big win condition. As that man, four so hundred damage away, so is uh, Yarkor from picking up that Discordia passive. Awesome, Jake. Been on a bit of a journey this game. It was a great wall to, to slow down that fight a moment ago, but still pays for it with his life. 
Blue buff looked at now by the Olympus Bolts. There's been plenty of pressure pushing against the Arcor, and a one-level lead for Haddock still remains here in this lane. What's the response, though, from the Leviathan? Spit slow as Rongyu does end up rotating on in. Blue buff still up. Blue buff being whittled on away. Rongyu gets the hammer onto Awesome Jake. Yarkor half HP, but the reinforcements are in, and Awesome Jake left alone. Shards of Ice It's going to get a little bit of damage here, but that's all that Jake can do as Yarkor picks up a kill, and that closes up some of that gap. Haddock's had done well in, in maintaining this one-level yeah. lead, and now it's gone. I was waiting with bated breath for that ult from Jake to do massive amounts of damage, like ready. way more than I was, I was expecting. I did to see it do so little, also took my breath away, but the wrong way, where I'm like, oh no, Jake, oh, like, that is unfortunate. I was curious, are the bolts maybe jump in, fight? Uh, no, they didn't want one to, especially off of that damage. Jake just didn't have enough setup for them. I admire where he's going, but unfortunately, that's two deaths now on Jake there. So if you're a Bolts fan, they clean that up. Luckily, it's not Lasber this time around. Last time, Lasber was definitely under the iron. Now they're looking this for is a pyro. Call. This is a call that the Olympus Bolts like. They like early game Pyromancers here. Rongyu knows it's happening. The Olympus Bolts will make no mistake. Ven eats the hammer, and the Pyromancer does go down. I think it's important. Look, it's felt like the Leviathans have had good responses to some of this early setup here. It's been Jake that's been caught out a couple of times. Love the way he plays, but it's not uncharacteristic for Jake on Ymir to die a couple of times early in the game and then maybe turn things around later. It's important to look at, though, the Bolts have 1.2k lead right now, despite being down in the kills department. The, the first Blood Bounty may be playing into that a little bit. But the Olympus Bolts, despite being down, it felt like they've been, they've been driving some of the pressure. The Leviathans have had just good replies onto Jake. You have to imagine some of that gold is going to be that purple buff invade we saw a little bit earlier, as well as some of the jungle strips that we've seen. Ooh. They might be able to pull back even more, though. Lasbro wants Leviathan. the stun. Yeah, Lasbro gets caught out. Lasbro wants the stun and said, get stunned. And Lord of the Afterlife, that, that's got to be the third time I've seen it used. And the third time it's been used to, to get out of the fray. Granted, early on in the game, maybe you're okay with that, just trying to keep yourself on the map. And Lasbro will go back to base. Lasbro's probably fine with it, Gore, because he's two levels ahead over Panatom right now. And so there is maybe a little bit of where the gold lead comes in for the Olympus Bolts here. And that is a quiet two-level lead, because, yeah. because that's pretty beefy in the jungle for, for 12 minutes in. That, that is nothing to scoff at. Lasbro has just been farming and farming and farming and uh, and quietly, you know, level and a half maybe as uh, Panatom continues to farm as well. We'll maybe see now if Lasbro is able to push that advantage for the Olympus Bolts, get the kills back in check. It's the counterbalance to the mid lane right now, right? Like Vin just slightly behind Shinta was level right. uh, 11 to 13, now 12 to 13, so probably around that same level and a half mark where things are just enough behind that you can catch up it's seemingly, but we'll see how well that's going to be maintained because now we're getting more damage online. Charon's coin just picked up there for Venenu, but it's that Spear of Desolation. I kind of hearkened to it earlier. Like, I, you know, a little bit of anti-heal, like that Brawlers for Panatom, feels fine. I don't think you need to, to harp on it that badly <laughs> if you're the Leviathans here. So I actually love this. Just go for more power, oh, hit nice, harder, do more if you're Shinto. And I think this is going to, again, especially now at the level 14 mark, 13 minutes in. First off, Shinto's power farming with how far he, he's able to kind yeah, of escape man. the timer. But also, this is going to be great for team fights. Uh, Gold Fury started up by the Olympus Bolts. Awesome Jake, despite being 0-2, also two levels ahead of Rangu. I don't know what's going on in the levels department here. The Leviathans are funneling their farm, it feels like, onto Shinto and the carries. Okay. And the, uh, the Olympus Bolts quickly take down the Gold Fury. It's not a fight the Leviathans wanted to take. Haddox was there as an insurance policy, while Yarkor continues to farm on the right-hand side of the map, gets a Tier 1 tower over there. So the Olympus Bolt score a, a, a swift call right around this Gold Fury, and they're the ones who end up taking it down early in this game. It still took a little longer. Like, look, the Leviathans, they got on that fast. But it's still, I think, props to the Bolts for being able to pick it up. Again, hearkening or making a much larger deficit there for the Leviathans. Granted, 14 minutes in, it's not enough that it's really running away with anything. But they're able to start pulling that ahead, plus that experience, as we've kind of already highlighted, that they do have in their favor. Fights like this Man. are necessary to win for the Leviathans. Haddock's used his beats. Glasper has been a a counter steel machine, it feels like. Stole away the Greatest Scorpion a moment ago. I'll return to that as a double knockup from Haddox. Gets Yarkor and Rongyu a bit out of sorts over here in the FG pit. Panatom left alone, and Venenu gets his first kill of the game. Now we go back to the right-hand side where Haddox bouncing on around. Yarkor's going to get collapsed on here as Lazbro leaps in. It's aggressive this time from Lord of the Afterlife, and Yarkor falls down.
I don't know who to clap harder for there. You were Doug. That was phenomenal tracking of the fight. I mean, watching it break out in two spots. It's always but Doug, it's by the, the way. Over extension. Yes, it's absolutely. Doug is, the answer. Doug is always the MVP. He's in every single SPL game. But Yarkor Panatom, they extend way too far. You had mentioned Lazar being this like counter steel machine. Yep. Not only is he capable of doing that, he manages to keep the Leviathans at bay and hold them still long enough that they're able to get that fight. And the rotation, I, I think, from the Leviathans did not expect to be met by Jake and Venenu. I think they were expecting this to be, okay, cool, we're in a 2v2, we're going to turn it into a 3v2, easy peasy. Oh, why is the Whoops. mid laner and the support here and the yep. fire giant and the FG? Let's call him an MVP for that fight as well because he got a lot of damage out there for them to help really solidify those kills and turn things back over in favor of the Bolts. And that's just an unfortunate engage for the, the Leviathans. This is interesting, Gorn. I'm glad I, I peek over at the, uh, the net worth charts here. Uh, Barracuda has fallen, or excuse me, Barracuda is not falling behind. He is ahead of Zapman by he's about. He's fallen a, ahead. He's of fallen ahead. He's, he's <laughs> tilted himself forward of Zapman by about a thousand gold here. Literally yeah. nothing has happened over on the dual lane. XP close to equal as, uh, as both levels are similar there. But a thousand gold for Barracuda is going to be feeling good. Apple might be enough, and Anu has to use the Aegis here to keep himself in the fight, at least on the map. But he's not going to be able to get back in. Sheeto gets knocked up by Haddix. The Salmon Leap is there. It's a brilliant strike. What a wall. But the wall's incredible from Awesome Jake. And Haddix will pick up a kill onto Shinto here. The Discordia falls for the first time this game. They're looking to continue getting aggressive since Vin is alive. He's going to be back in this fight in no time. It doesn't even matter. He's going towards left. You've got Barra here to help push down the tower. Wow, Yarkor and Wrong Yu, they stay. And they stay in the mid lane. The wall from Jake so close to being perfect. So Yarkor is able to shimmy his way on in through the right, or way on out, excuse me, through the right hand side of that wall. But now Awesome Jake, bit of body block. Wrong Yu transforms Shard Device to delay things out. But Zatman will get the kill by the end of it. Around the back side of the Leviathans is Lasbra. Looks like the snipes from Barracuda will be the icing on this cake. The Olympus Bolts get a tier one in mid. They kill off Shinto, but they lose Jake in tow. Still feels worthwhile, especially if they can get this Pyromancer. But look at the Leviathans. They're not letting this one go without a fight. In fact, yep. I like that they're getting aggressive. They know they have an advantage here. Yarkor stays on the Pyro. Lazarus joined the fight here. Lord of the Afterlife is there. Lord of the Afterlife gets used. Panatom locked down in place. Drop kick. Pulls Lazbra on back. It's the winds of Shamash that does most of the work there. Look at Haddix chasing down Zapman here, who has both actives. And this time smartly holds on to both. Probably both teams there, Gore, just seeing if they could pick up an extra kill on the end, and neither are successful. Yeah, Barrett, look, they're in an awkward spot where you have no mana, but you have both relics, and they might not be able to get the Pyromancer, but you can't really get the Pyromancer as the Leviathan's starting it up this time. I, I just don't think there's much ways to yeah, fight that. I, I think it's a good call from, from specifically from Barra, but the rest of the bolts to back off. Vin still has a minute left before his beats are back, a little more than that before the Aegis come through. Beats burn down there for Jake as well. So a lot of these next what, minute and a half fights, if anything breaks through, specifically around a fire giant, but maybe keep your eyes over towards that Primal Fury that's going to be spawning in a few minutes. That's where I think a lot of these pressure points against the bolts are, are really going to start being felt. If those relics aren't up, which realistically beats for Vin should be, but the other two, well, that might cause some problematic situations for them if the Leviathans are able to get the engage they want, but they're starting to trail Dave, and they're starting to trail heavily. Here's what's terrifying for the Leviathans, is that Awesome Jake is 0-3 on Ymir, and that, that seems to be just the, uh, that seems to be the death sentence for teams. If you pile onto Jake early, for, that, that's his passive. We've discussed player passives. Jake is, if you're playing Ymir and you die, you're 0-2 early on in the game, you suddenly have a great game afterwards. Picked up a couple assists still in the meantime. Still two levels up. But still, right, it's two levels up over Wrong You, where it felt like, it feels like Jake, he has one less assist, but but has just been there for more farm. And that's kept Jake in a great spot here. He has a sovereignty now for himself. Haddix with a pestilence. So uh, the frontliners here itemizing against a little bit of what the Leviathans are bringing to the table. And I'll harp on it even more. All kills the Leviathans have picked up are on the Jake. That is maybe the dream. Right. If you're a support, like, it kind of sucks if it I'll all happens that. within five minutes, but 19 minutes in, they've got three kills and they're all on your support. You're more than happy to be sacrificing yourself for your team's advantage here. And it's opening up a lot of doors and avenues. This Primal Fury being the next point of contention between these two teams. Jake knows, especially at this point, the Sov picked up. He's finished stacking that Thebes. He's tanky enough to get aggressive, and even if it costs him his life, I mean, look at it, Haddix is level 17, he's yep. going to be able to jump into the back line, no problem. This is a full strength fight, Gore. All 10 ultimates on the map, all 20 actives are there as well. Vision Shard for Rongyu. Yeah, he just ticked 12. Is the one who, he just reaches level 12, but I don't know how big of an advantage you call that. The Leviathans could wrap around. Look at the envelopment that's happening. Duo lane from duo lane, mid lane from mid lane, but Haddix is going to cut off that path. 
Apple connects onto the Kokoma. Panatom, he's in alone. He takes so much damage. The wall from Jake keeps Panatom right where he is. And now the Ymir on the board for the first time. I thought Barrow was going to have a huge snipe moment. He only needed one. And then they still get the kill. Now they're getting aggressive. Lazbra, maybe too deep. But look at the rest of the bolts. They're starting to move forward. They know they have the Primal Fury. Primal Fury is down to half HP. Zatman wants nothing to do with them, nor do the rest of the Leviathans. It's an early pick on a Panatom. Or we've discussed this. It feels like junglers in all three games now have had uh, have had tough games. Zatman sends out his ultimate. The wall from Jake feels like it lasts forever there. Zatman probably agrees. Uh, Boar gets used. But now we've seen three games in a row where one jungler or the other has just has just been jumped on, just been sat on. Lasbro was what 0 and five at this point in game yeah. number two, something like that. Panatom is 0 and three, three out of five kills for the Olympus Bolts are on a Panatom. Feels like the junglers have struggled in this set. They know where they've been able to put the pressure. You mentioned it, now I'm just curious if we could see what Jake is leveling up here for, for the Ymir, because you mentioned the wall lasting longer. It does when you level it up, so it's something that, it, depending on whether he's gone freeze carpet, or better yet, nice. carpet into wall, it looks like, and being able to get that. So it's lasting as long as it can, the freeze. is going to be coming up here, what, I guess ult at level 16, and so 17 should finally yep. maximize that one. He's been skipping a lot of points in that ult. That's why he's not doing any damage. He doesn't care about it. He's been trying to get every single thing he can elsewhere in his kit. Well, it's not often you get to watch a Ymir throw up a wall and then we just sort of chill and stare at it, right? And I mean, that, that really gives you a sense of, of how long it feels like it can last. Because normally yeah, a big wall goes up and then the rest of the fight happens and you kind of turn your eyes away from the wall. Uh, and so awesome Jake in these, uh, in these big jungle team fights yeah, will be able really to make a bit of a difference there. A nice stun uh, duration here. So six seconds. Six seconds, which feels like forever, doesn't it? In uh, in, in, smite in game time, time in yeah. No. Time, six in seconds. I am trying to run away from this giant ice giant. Uh, I I want to get away. I don't want to be part of this. Six seconds is forever. Oh and the god. fact that look, I mean, uh, oh this my is god, it's a still perfect there. <laughs> example. So it's there for the disengage. It's there for the engage. But because you can cancel it early now, like that used to be the the uh, really hard yeah. balancing point. Was like I throw up a bad wall. Yeah. We're screwed because of it, not them. Now, hey, I throw up a bad wall. I'm gonna cancel it. I get the cooldown going immediately, and we know that we can then change the pace of a fight. It doesn't necessarily hurt as much. And let's face it, Jake's been throwing up some good walls. You know what, he awesome? hasn't had to cancel it too much. I can hear awesome Jake right now. If you're saying that to him, you'd say, you know I'm awesome goat, buddy. I've never oh, thrown yeah. up a bad wall in my life or something <laughs> like that. He's never needed to cancel a wall. And as of late, it's maybe started to feel that way. The Jake passive activated, started off 0-2, has gotten a kill and a couple of assists, assists since then. Now the Olympus Bolts, in a slower-paced game, have continued to build up that gold lead. Right at 6k is where the Olympus Bolts are, despite only having a two-kill advantage over the Leviathans. It's been those objectives, Gore, and yeah. a lot of the farm as well has just not been successfully uh, successfully contested by this Leviathans team. And so really what you got to wait for here, when do we see the power of this Bolts lead in a team fight? Oh. Probably soon. Now. Fire Giant's getting looked at by Jake, but he's just trying to get the setup. A good wall, good freeze is all it's going to take to just eat through the Leviathan team. Oh, well, good wall on the Shinto who can dash away. That's something to look out for as this game goes on. Shinto can get away from some of those awesome Jake walls. Rongyu takes some damage from the mid lane from Vanadu. Now Yarkor and Rongyu jump on in onto the mid laner. The Tom is there as well. So much backline dive. But Barracuda and Ben, they combine for a kill. Zatman's got it done, though, on the other side of the fight as well. The snipes from Barracuda try to add some range into this engagement. Mantle of Discord with a big stun, but Shinto over the wall will find the kill there. And now it's just the back line for the Olympus Bolts. The Leviathans have shredded the rest of this fight. A double kill for Shinto, and the Leviathans stand strong despite a deficit. I love the fact that they, like, look, Panatom goes in and he does exactly what he needs to. He gets both carries away from the fight. Lazbra, yeah, he can do a little bit of damage, but nowhere near the amount that Vin and Vera put out. You separate the problem from the rest of the team, and the Bolts have nothing to stand on. They just shred through the front line at that point. Jake, then Haddix, then Lazbra. And look, Barra is strong. I actually admire him because one of the things he does at the very end, he sees four Leviathans running at him. Harkor is incredibly low. He turns his eyes towards Shinto and Zatman. He's like, I'm going to take at least one of you out. That is worth my life. Unfortunately for him, he doesn't quite find it. Leviathans turn a huge fight back into their favor. And they get that fire giant, Dave. That's, that's just clean. Pretty indicative, or, or pretty a, a, a good example of how big the gold lead was is after a big fight and after getting the FG, the Leviathans are still 3,000 gold behind here. So it's these next few minutes where that gold lead can really get flipped around. There's still four towers on the map, Gore. Yeah, 5,000 gold. And I, I think it's going to be 
it, it's an interesting, I think, test of the Bolts play calling here where you're fighting against a, a team full of FG for the Leviathans, but you probably still feel like you have a lead. You do in many cases. You're still one level up in the jungle. You're one level up over there in support, so XP may be less of a lead, but in the gold department, maybe you still feel like you can fight. And this is uh, the area where Primal Fury is about to come up. I think I go there first, then Harken down the left tower, because you know you've got one, and then you're going to have the tier two. You're gonna, Again, 5,000 gold just in towers on the map. That gets them over that deficit, plus Primal Fury, which sets them up for more objectives later in the game, but also gives them a little bit of chunk into their pockets now. I think it's going to make things a lot more interesting for the Leviathans here. The only issue I have is whether or not even with the Tier 1 tower, they're going to be able to get into the Phoenix range. Normally, these Tier 2s are, are a given, right? You expect no one to, to mount a defense here, but the Bolts, like we've been harping on, have the lead still in levels. They have one level up over Panatom, who's not yet 20. One level up there on Rong Yu compared to where Jake is. They could mount a defense around a Tier 2. It's not easy, but it's still something they could try. Well, at this point, with the Fire Giant, you know, the towers aren't going to be wildly impactful, right? I mean, they're, they're not going to necessarily tilt the fight entirely, but maybe if this Fire Giant push extends to a Phoenix, we'll see this Emperor Emperor's armor that yeah. Rongyu picked up potentially having somewhat of an impact, but maybe that shows you the Leviathans want to want to get as much gold, as much value out of this early Fire Giant, early by maybe a Fire Giant standard, probably standard by Fire Giant standards, but by the first Fire Giant of the game, the Leviathans want to get as much value out of this one as they can. Stuns exchange, it's Rongyu! All the CC flies onto the support, and here's the go button from the Olympus. What a wall! wall from Jake. It's got two members of the Leviathans locked in place. Zapman uses the active. They won't matter this time. Down goes Zap, and the Artemis falls, and Lazra will provide some slows on the Yarkor. And he might be low, but it's not low enough for the kill oh to turn God. around. I mean, what a pickup, and what a turnaround for the Bolts. The wall, I want to say, most credit because of the lockdown that it gave to Zap. Death timer score. Realistically, look at look at Ron Hugh. Granted, he's back in 20 seconds. That's insane how quickly he's going to be able to return. But the fact of the matter, he, I mean, he just gets burned before he even knows what's going on. No way to get out of that Tier 2 in time, and that makes it so much easier. And now the team with Fire Giants is the one that's retreating. And, and that's that's what I was wondering. The Bolts still have this gold lead. How would they use it on defense? And effectively is the answer. Now the left side Phoenix likely taken down by the Olympus Bolts. But I just have to be careful here. There's still 20 and 10 seconds, respectively, on the respawn timers for Yarkor and Zapman. If, if there's an overextension there, and three more kills fall, it would be early and without FG, but could have been some, uh, some beads of sweat there on the Titan for the Leviathans, but instead the Bolts will push their lead the way they can. The gold lead has shrunk down. The Leviathans got some of that tower uh, gold that was left there on the map, Gore, but a big fight back in, and now it's only Panatom and Shinto that have that FG buff. Maybe I'm overestimating how helpful the Jagger is, or maybe it's just so far out there on that left side, like that little like divot on the left. But I was expecting maybe a little bit of pressure over there from, from the Bolts. Look, at this point, you burned down every minute that you needed to, which is that Fire Giant buff. It's like nine seconds left. Yeah, that Panatom and Shinto aren't doing anything in those nine seconds that are going to make you go crazy. And that's where it's time to do the, the collateral, right? What, what went down for each team? Phoenix went down for the Leviathans. That's that's a huge win for the Bolts. And what did you lose side. on the other side? Oh, man, you lost a Primal Fury and a Tier 1 Tower. Oh, man, <laughs> this is a huge win for the Bolts when you look at that, plus burning down that Fire Giant. It was a really well-fought FG coordinated attack yeah. from the Leviathans that got them into a good position, but you had highlighted it, and we had kind of touched on it, that gold lead and, and just the level experience lead that they had at the time made the Bolts cap more than capable of defending a Tier 2, as we saw. I was thinking it'd be a risky yep. defense. It didn't even seem to have any risks associated with it. But can the Leviathans do it again? That deficit was, what, 6K last time they went into the Fire Giant Pit? Now they're only 1,000 down. That's that's much easier to try and tackle here, especially in a 5-on-5. Five five. The Relics aren't as easy. They still want to wait about, what, 30 seconds before they get the Aegis there for Shinto and Zap. Somewhat concerning, though, for the Bolts is that the last time we fought around this FG, they were up by like 6k gold, right? And now the Leviathan's right back to, you know, maybe even call it even outside of a, a couple tiers of items on a couple of the players on either side. It's a much closer fight, maybe gold-wise at least, and even XP-wise, than things were the first time. But you feel like this is one 
that the Volts have the opportunity in. lasbro has got the attention of two in the mid lane. It's Yarkor and Panatom. And look at this. Panatom realizes he's needed elsewhere. Apple connects onto Haddox, and there's a lot of damage in that one. Snipes from Barracuda provide some damage, but Panatom wow. is left on in. And now Barracuda has to roll out away. It's happening again. The Leviathans find themselves in control around the FG. Barracuda's going to be the third one to fall in the Leviathans. They're going to threaten this FG once more. Look, Lazra and Vin are alive. Not a whole ton they could do here. I was wondering if Vin or Lazra, I guess, with the painstaking rush, there's no way he's going to get there in time. Could go for something. But look at the fire minions yeah. actually over there getting a little bit of damage done onto the Titan. If they can keep that wave pushed up and at least keep that Phoenix in distress, then there is a little this bit gotta of This has got to be Phoenix. How least, deep right? are they going well, down? Look at this. Because look, H Haddock's Jake, and Bear are still 20 to 30 seconds away from being back. I think Laz and Ven realize that, that there's no chance of them defending underneath this Phoenix, but you, you gotta go back to base. Vazbrin and Venenu agree. 20 seconds on Barracuda, 10 on Haddox and Jake as well. The Leviathans work in towards the Titan. lazbra has been stunned, and the Lord of the Afterlife connects onto everyone that's here from the Leviathans, but the Titan now being damaged. Venenu doing his best to pour out the damage that he can. What is it with these two teams? The Titan fights, Haddox respawns, gets the kill on Aranyu, Yarkor being swung on down. Zetman uses the Aegis, that'll keep him in the fight. He'll do one better, he gets the double, but Venenu returns and now Bear is back, baby, and he's looking to do damage. Hardcore is the next one on the list. Yarkor gets oh, the snipes? on off by Jake. Can Barracuda get anything with the snipes? A little bit of damage. Now Benanu trying to chase down Yarkor. There's some damage. There's a knockup, but Yarkor sidesteps that one. The stripe in place on a Benanu likely means this one's done. The Titan stands at half HP. Phoenix is about to respawn for the Leviathans over there on left, which is more than you could say. This Phoenix dead on the right-hand side. Last we're gone for 15 seconds. Haddix in 30. So they've got a little bit of maintenance to do. Otherwise, that could have been a win. You get one more kill there. I think if you get rid of Shinto or you get rid of Harkor, I think you can rush straight down left and kill that Titan. But I think there's too much on the other side, and admittedly too much for them to deal with right now. But they have a lot. Look, an Oni Fury, Barry Kuda seems to have his eyes on that. Although Panatom might have something to say about it. Oni Fury looked at by Yeah, Barra you get out of there. <laughs> yeah, uh, Barra has something else in mind. Beads just came back up. Aeg is still 25 seconds away. This is wild, because look, th this is the type of fight that if the, the Volts lose, this is where the Leviathans could look to end the game. Barracuda jumped on in the back line, and Panatom deletes him for free. It's a freeze from Awesome Jake on the other side of things, and now it's a shard device to keep the Leviathans locked on in, but Barracuda's not here, but Anu has to use the, the disengage here, whatever he's got from the Morgan Lefay, but the Leviathans win the skirmish, and he'll get the Fury as well. You we have to remember, the last time they these two the teams fought at this point, Dave, was during the playoffs. Leviathans only got one game there, and then it was a three-game sweep for the Bolts. So maybe looking for a little bit of revenge there. But this is a five and a, this is an undefeated Bolts team at this point right now. And they're the ones that, look, they're struggling to keep this title alive. It's barely over half health. And meanwhile, Panatom's doing due diligence, making sure that no minions are going to knock down that left side Phoenix. That's the last wave, I believe, last little bit of fire minions that are going to be running down. This is a great spot for the Leviathans. What was a 6k deficit is now turned into, what, a 7k lead? 7k lead. The ping, and going up. The ping pong of this game, the back and forth, the tug of war of a gold lead. Gets the heart going here, Gormizer, and what a game three we've what got. What a knockup. Haddix finds the back line, and it's a three-man knockup there, but the boar use, that's early in this fight by Zapman, and this is where the bolts can flourish. They've waited out that big ultimate lockdown. Rongyu doesn't have his ultimate up for a little bit longer either, and so the bolts got what they came for. They got a big space control ultimate down, but look at the pushback in from the Leviathan. So Vin's ult's gonna come through. Bear is alive, and that damage is pouring out. Haddix dashes on away from Panatom as Lazbra finds his way into the back line. Oh, what one more snipes! snipe! Barracuda's got it! Zapman goes down. Titan being worked on by a couple fire minions here, but the Olympus bolts, they want to search for it. There's a slow on the Panatom, and the wall from Awesome Jake will force out the leap away. But Lazbra wants more. The rest of the bolts do as well. There's a stun on the other side. It's a tether from Panatom, or from Lazbra, that gets things done. But Anu from range what a wall. gets a kill on the Panatom. Shinto uses the beads. That'll keep him on the map. But the roar is there. The Yegus falls off, and Awesome Jake picks up the kill. Oh, but Hardcore has more in mind. No, the stun, the CC the is Olympus so good. Bolts. Could have killed off Barra. The Olympus Bolts. It looks like they've gotten it done here, Gormizer. It's wrong you alone for the next 25 seconds until Zatman is back up and respawned. A fight in their own base gone right, and the Olympus Bolts working to the left hand side of the map at Gore. I'm not sure the Leviathans have the legs to defend this one. 
Uh, unfortunately, Ten last person's on, on base zap. defense. Ten seconds? I don't know. This is taking a lot longer than I think they wanted it to. Five on zap. Wrong Yu is in behind the Olympus Bolt here. We'll have to see how quickly this it's one burns delayed. out. It's a disarm on the Barracuda. Is wrong Yu done enough here? Zap Man back That's up. Back. He's got the board in as well. Shards of ice drops on That's down. Low. Can Zap Man get it done? No, he can. And the oh Olympus my God. Bolt take it in three. Yeah, look how low they were at the Vin. The Vin and Lasbro are, are just a second away from death there. If you had just a little more time. Zapman almost pulls that back. What a hell of a game to close My it God. out on. How many Titan defenses was that? And look how good these guys are feeling for good reason. Right, Gore? I mean, what a game. The back and forth. 6-0. and oh. All right, the Olympus Bolts. It's not always. I'm sweating. I forgot dude. about That's that part. I, I'm so, uh, crazy, look, I'm right? still in the, the fire giant pit for the last fight. My goodness. And there, there's just something about these two teams. Whenever they meet up, there's, there's Titan fights, there, there's back and forth. Yeah. It, it was last year where, where you had the, the Miracle 100 HP on the Titan and, and the, the, the then Renegades, now Bolts were able to win that game too. There's something unbelievable about it, but that is the studio game here. The Olympus Bolts are able to take it in three over the Leviathans. Yeah, I'm going to go fan my armpits a little bit <laughs> while, we, uh, while we head to break. <laughs>
Hello, Smite fans, and welcome back to the Smite Pro League, powered by Alienware. And talk about a set to get the day rolling, but more importantly, all of this action in studios brought to you thanks to our sponsors over at Alienware. You can head on over to smitegame.com slash Alienware. Make sure to plug code SMITEAW for a primo 240 hertz monitor of your own, just like what the pros are playing on here in studios, as well as those Ryzen desktop PZs. A really nice PC. I, I really can't stress that enough. And again, like like I said, you guys can have one of your very own by heading on over to smitegame.com slash Alienware and making sure to plug SMITEAW as your discount code. And not only that, you can also keep up with Alienware throughout any of their giveaways that they might be having happen on social medias by following them over at Alienware on Instagram and Twitter, as well as the fact that you can join AlienwareArena.com for their global community and make sure to stay on top with all things Alienware. Really can't thank them enough for making this in-studios treat as fantastic fantastic as possible for the players and for our viewing pleasures, but of course, have to break down everything that just happened, Mifflin, in this first set between the Bolts and Leviathans, and I really don't think we could have gotten a better in-studios performance between these two teams. I'm so jealous, man, that I didn't get to cast that one. What a crazy end to that. And let me just go ahead and preface this by saying, if you're going to step to the Kings, and I'm not talking about Camelot, you better come correct. I don't care how close you are to shutting down the Titan, the Olympus Bolt stuck in it every single step of the way. These guys are playing as a squad. They're concise. The shot calling is there. And, and Dave framed it perfectly in that last team fight. The second the Atlantis Leviathans utilize their team fight abilities, the Bolts say, oh, word, no Caledonian boar? No chance you step up against me and immediately surge forward with this great ultimate from Barracuda. Zatman wasn't allowed to play in that fight. Zetman being removed from the battlefield certainly made the rest of that engagement incredibly awkward and ultimately impossible for the Atlantis Leviathans to have the appropriate damage response that they needed to try and top of the Olympus Bolts. Not only that, but this highlight specifically, this was a game changer here by Awesome Jake. That wall being the only reason why the Leviathans weren't able to properly siege that Titan towards the end. I think otherwise we might have been looking at a game end right then and there, Mifflin, but Awesome Jake just saving the day with the mirror. Fantastic team fight and setup as well. And the follow-up could not have been made easier here for Benenu and Barracuda. And that's only his second ever land performance. If that's what second land jitters look like, God bless the teams I got to step against 408 once he's got a couple more under his belt. These guys are looking good. And look, when we came into this year, I said, Bolt's probably going to be around third, fourth seed the entirety of the year. Yeah, uh, undefeated still here in phase two. Kind of wild. These guys are so consistent. They work so well together. I mean, uh, it's almost all buzzwords because that's all you can use to describe this level of play because that's what they are the epitome of. See, Mifflin, they, they heard you and they took that personally. Okay. <laughs> Please, I hope you, you, not. You They're scary. You don't call the Bolts a, a third and fourth place team that early on in the year. Yo, you really got to wait and see how these teams transition and pretty much develop over time. But the Bolts, of course, their front line definitely making it happen all throughout this set today. And granted, I have to give credit where credit is due. I think for what it's worth, the Leviathans definitely looked really strong. I think that this should be a really interesting roster to kind of follow along with as they continue with their recent roster swaps. But more importantly, the bolts and the action and all of that victory royale celebration made possible. We've got Dolson actually standing by with Haddix to break it down a little bit further as to what happened in that set. That's right, Haddix is with me. They, all right, so we had Barra. All right, Ven, they're sending me you. And until I get one of you guys that doesn't uh, meme the interview, they're just going to keep going on down the list. So if you never want to do an interview again, you can just, you know, meme it, I guess. Did uh -huh. you take it personally when Miff called you guys a, a third, fourth place team? Is that, was, that what's driving you guys here? It, it, I took it very personally. Oh, I'm so sorry. But it's okay. I forgive him. We proved him wrong. That's right. You proved him wrong. Now we're here. Look, it, it, and we can see the emotion. And that's why I love these land games so much because it was such a back and forth set. It was chaotic. Um, incredible game. Maybe one of one of the best of the year so far. There in game number three. Um, you know, what does it what does it mean to you guys? What does it mean? Not the right way to word it. How, how much different is it winning a game like that? You're in with your boys there in the player booth versus online and you know there's, there's still some fun online i'm sure but but it's got to be better here in the booth oh i mean dude that this reminds me of like playing a worlds again yeah. uh yeah i mean playing a land is always going to be way more satisfying than playing online you see the you're the other team across from the booth yeah <laughs> uh i mean it's just you play differently on land it's a lot more intense and 
Right. The, the win always feels a lot better. Well, you can't Mifflin rule him, right? You can't point and say anything. It was the underhand point that, that got Mifflin in trouble uh, all those years ago. But a lot of fun to watch nonetheless. You, you were actually kind of describing it to me before we came to the interview. You know, it was chaos in that, that final fight. It was back and forth. The Leviathan's threatening your Titan. Kind of, kind of walk through again what you walked through with me. You know, you're getting oboe proc. You couldn't blink in on the uh, on the Kukulin there towards the end. You got bored. A uh, bit of a tough game there with uh, with all you were eating on the front line. Yeah, when you're Kukulin and it's a late game and they have Sunder, you know, <laughs> I blink on this Artemis oh, and yeah. this Disco and then they just instantly kill me. I get Sundered. I'm gone. Um, so yeah, I kind of stunk it up a bit. Uh, no. I didn't. I didn't blink because I got oboe proc in, in the crucial <laughs> FG fight, but. You know, in the end, it didn't matter. It is matter. what it is. That's we right. Won, you guys, so it doesn't matter. The bolts, uh, Olympus bolts win. That's what we're seeing behind us. Yeah, I mean, it's right there, so it doesn't <laughs> matter, right? No one, no one remembers it, Do so you think, we're fine. Well, talk to me a little bit about Jake as well, because it feels like there's something about Jake on Ymir, where, where he starts off like 0-2 or 0-3, and, and then somehow finds a way to turn things around. His KDA wasn't, you know, knocked down, drag out, incredible here this game, but as much of a memer as he is, he's got to have some resilience in that brain to, uh, to keep things online, despite a tough start. I mean... I love Jake. He, uh, you know, sometimes he just, he dies sometimes. It and, happens, you know? right? <laughs> and happens. that's that's perfectly fine because, you know, sometimes he's going to turn around the game completely. That's right. So, you know, you, you take the trade off there. It's so you saying frontliners got it done today? Is this a frontline win for the Bolts or a whole team <laughs> it's a, win? It's a whole team, whole team win. Always. Oh, Haddock's with the, uh, the, the thumbs up answer to the entire team. Thanks for uh, for standing up with me. Normally I'd say sitting down with me. Yeah, no Thanks problem. for standing up with me for I'll the interview. I'll stand up with you anytime. Oh, love to hear that. We're going to stand some more after we go back to the desk and they finish breaking this one down. Appreciate you guys, Dulcet and Haddix, and a lot of confidence definitely brimming from Haddix, and for good reason. The Bolts now continue their reign here in Split 2 Mifflin. They're going to be top of the standing still. Six wins to their name. Camelot Kings looking to try and close the gap, but Mifflin, Olympus Bolts starting to get a little bit of a breakaway here. They are. I mean, even if the Kings win their next set, and they are up next since, uh, in the sets here, they're still going to be stuck in that second place seed. Somebody's going to have to put the kibosh to the bolts. I mean, you're not just going to catch up to them. You have to beat them now to take off their seeding. This is a crazy start to phase two already for the Olympus Bulls. And the confidence we saw from Haddix, well earned. Very often we'll see some teams come in. They're uh, gassing themselves up a little bit too much. Got that clown moniker. No, not the Bulls. These guys have earned every single bit. They can say whatever they want as far as I'm concerned because, well, they've earned it. Certainly. I, I can definitely agree with you on that one, Mifflin. But as we just talked about, the Olympus Bolts, they're going to clinch things out here up against the Atlantis Leviathans and continue their reign of terror in Split 2. But we still have a little bit more Smite Pro League action coming up next. We'll have the Camelot Kings for your viewing pleasure up against the Jade Dragon. So make sure to take this break opportunity to go grab some snacks and get situated because I have a feeling we could be looking at another long one, guys, based off of how we saw Set 1 go today. So we'll be right back. Hope to see you with us. Thank <laughs> you. 